Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the 22nd meeting of the committee in 2013. Uh, can I ask everyone to ensure that all mobile devices are switched off, please? Um, agenda item one is a declaration of interest. Uh, can I first of all uh, thank John Pentland for his contribution uh, to the committee? And I'm sure committee members will join me in wishing him all the best in his new roles. Uh, and can I welcome Richard Baker to the committee? Uh, and Richard, can I ask you if you have any uh, interests which are relevant to the remit of the committee? I need to declare that I'm a member of the United Trade Union. Thank you very much. Uh, ag agenda item two is the decision on whether to take business in private. Uh, can we agree to take item six and eight in private? Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Agenda item three is on subordinate legislation. Uh, it's the consideration of an affirmative statutory instrument seeking to extend the provisions of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002 to include arm's length external organisations, also known as ALIOs, uh, which were established by local authorities to deliver leisure and culture services. Uh, members have a copy of the SSI along with a cover note from the clerk. We have two panels of witnesses to discuss this SSI today. The first panel consists of witnesses representing ALIOs, local authority leisure and culture directors, as well as the voluntary sector. Uh, the witnesses have made written submissions, which members also have. Uh, can I welcome uh, to the committee today uh, Kieran Vango, uh, Chief Executive, and Craig Given, Finance and Resources Manager of Inverclyde Leisure, uh, Meryl Smith, Head of Leisure, Culture and Communities Policy at Dundee City Council, uh, and Treasurer of VOCAL, which is the voice of Chief Officers of Cultural and Leisure Services in Scotland, uh, and Felix Spittal, Policy Officer for the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Um, can I ask you, as we have a very busy agenda today, uh, if you want to, to make some very brief uh, opening statements, we'll allow that. Who wants to go first? No opening statements. So. No opening statements. Uh, no, well, I have none particularly. Well, then I'll take off then, I suppose. Um, just to say that SCVO is supportive of this order to bring forward um, freedom of information to cover uh, the Leisure and Culture Trust. Um, we also support the extension of FOI to other uh, arm's length bodies as well, and we hope that further action will be taken. Um, in the coming year to uh, cover those bodies as well. Obviously, support of, of the principles of FOI um, and the public's right to know. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if I could start off the questioning uh, by asking uh, Mr. Van Gogh and Mr. Given uh, about the current situation uh, with Inverclyde Leisure. Um, in your submission, you said that some uh, responding to some FOIs would be rather costly. Can I ask what you respond to it at this moment in time? I would imagine that you would get uh, a number uh, of, uh, of questions from the general public about we, your we services. Have a, a customer comments um, procedure, so um, uh, mainly dealing with sort of more operational issues, um, not necessarily. Uh, it depends on what the freedom of information request was. The example I gave within the document was uh, one that could be time consuming um, to do with pool water tests that, that could take a lot of time and resource for us to put together. Most of the comments and, and complaints we deal with now are just letters going backwards and forwards and trying to um, appease the customers. Um, yeah, appease the customers. I think in your submission too, you mentioned uh, in a previous life with Glasgow City Council, um, right, yeah, uh, Mr. Given, was it, uh, with Glasgow City Council, um, which uh, you said you had uh, a, a person who uh, kept FOIing because uh, he was not getting a meeting to discuss a certain matter. Um, in terms of these vexatious type of situations, what do you think should be done? Well, un under the situation, um, we it was more it was more of a threat which was actually given to us than it actually carried out, and it it gave the council I work for it, it put the position into the the customer that we really had no choice but to meet with them and because of the threat of the FOI that they were that, that they were doing to us. We had one recently, actually. Um, uh, I've been new in position, I've only been in position sort of three months, but there was a restructure that took place just before I, I uh, uh, took charge. And um, 
because uh, one of the staff members was affected by the restructure, they threatened us with a freedom of information that they'll keep on putting them in until um, to, to disrupt the organisation. Obviously, if our focus is on that, it's not on the charitable aims that we have. In these circumstances, would it not have been easier, do you think, Mr Given, just to meet with the man in the first place to discuss uh, whatever issue it was that he actually had? Well, it wasn't personally myself, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree that, that that probably would be the best idea. So uh, if that kind of policy was in place to um, actually agree to meet with people with complaints, then there would not be uh, the, then the threat of or the possible threat of uh, these vexatious FOIs? Mm. Well, at Inverclyde Leisure, we do meet with people. Uh, good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. A any other comments uh, on this? Mr Spittle, in, in terms of uh, SCVO's submission, you have a, a very clear submission in your views, and you think that uh, these powers should be extended. Do you want to add to that in any way? Well, I just to reiterate what we said, I suppose, in a sense, um, alleles are a special case. I think they're exactly what the Section 5 legislation was designed for. Um, they're governed by local authorities, receive money from local authorities, and they deliver public services. So it's a clear case that they exercise functions of a public nature. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, in the Inverclyde submission in particular, then I, I notice you have some um, misgivings about uh, confidentiality, etc. My understanding is that FOI will apply from 2014 to all um, culture, sport, leisure, air, alleos, and um, that would mean existing contracts are, are covered. Do you see that as being a problem? Well, in terms of... Um if it comes in, then we'll make sure that we've got the systems and procedures to ensure that we we apply. Yeah, so. that's for for new ones or for retrospectively. Um, retrospectively, um, we'd have to organise and make sure that we've got um, we've we've got our filing systems up to date. Um, but I, I suppose go. I, I, what would you say, Craig? You've been in position longer. Uh, we will we will we'll do what we're required to do. We're, We'll build to that, but the way we're structured at the moment, we will need to put ourselves, we'll need to look at that and work out how we get our position to do what we're required, but we will, we will be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments from Elm Street? Can I ask you too about the decision that the alleos seem to be rather limited just now? It's not all alleos. Do you have a view on that? I know um, SCVO have. Do you have a view on why it wasn't extended more widely? It just seems to be culture, sport and leisure. Well, I think, um, you know, we're, we're a charitable leisure trust and we, we offer sort of cultural activities for the community. And um, uh, I know that we have a, a funding agreement with our local authority, but there's plenty of other people and voluntary organisations that do get funded by, uh, by pub the public purse as such. So I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be um, put out to everybody. You're talking about voluntary organisations, isn't Voluntary organisations as well, yeah. I mean, it's the same principle. I think we offer a, a service um, to, um, to the community, whether it's voluntary. We have volunteers within our organisation. Um, we're a charitable leisure trust, so I think it's the same. Isn't the key distinction the fact that you have the um, link to local authorities? We have a link in, within that, within that uh, funding agreement to the local authority, yes. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't operate within our memorandums and articles over um, Scotland, actually, as long as the board approve it. So I could, for example, um, run leagues in Aberdeen or, or whatever. That would be not part of the local authority funding agreement. In fact, I'd like to do that. I'd like to expand leisure and cultural activities to the whole of Scotland. But nonetheless, there is a distinction between the third sector and the, the voluntary sector and alios in terms of how you're set up and this uh, link with local authorities. Would you accept that? Yes, yeah, I mean, in terms of the way we're set up currently, yeah. Yes, and um, perhaps you'd like to comment and elaborate on that, Mr. Siddle? Um Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, that's certainly our position. Uh, the voluntary sector is obviously or the third sector, um, whichever term you refer to, is obviously diverse. There's a lot of different legal structures, a lot of different governance models, but there are some key principles which uh, divide the sector from the public sector, and it's important for us that those uh, principles are protected. And one of those that is key is that the third sector is seen to be by the public and is independent from government, local government and central government. So 
we wouldn't consider Alios uh, like Inverclyde Leisure to be part of the third sector. I, I think in your submission you suggest that they should be extended beyond what's proposed. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I think there's, the, you know, there's no good reason why the care services that are now being provided by Alios um, uh, and are starting to spring up. And I think Audit Scotland says there's 130 Alios, of which Leisure Trusts are just a few. So, um, in principle, I don't see any reason why they should, uh, FY shouldn't be extended to all arm's length bodies. And just finally, convener, then I think you you had some reservations about the the definition, the description of um, established, created solely by one or more local authorities. Do you have a better definition that you could suggest? Um, well, it was more just to bring that to the committee's attention. But I'm not, I don't actually have a better definition than that. But I, I suppose the concern that um, I had when I read through the order was that that perhaps uh, organisations, um, in terms of establishing a new body could work with another organisation. I think Riverside and Clyde work with Scottish Enterprise and others, so um, they could get around the FOI in that, in that way. I'm not sure that they could. It was just something for the committee could, to consider. OK, thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Um, this is a bit technical, and largely my question will end up in the Minister's uh, in tray rather than, uh, than yours. But, the amendment that's being made here is being made under Section 5 of the Freedom of Information rather than Section uh, 4, which would add you to the schedule of public authorities. So you are, you are not being added to the schedule of public authorities. Um, and, and that seems to me because you are uh, not either part of the Scottish administration or a Scottish public authority with mixed functions or no reserve functions. And is that your understanding insofar as you? Yes. yes. Right. OK. Now, one of the effects of that, of course, is that therefore, um, because you're not part of Schedule 1, uh, that Section 44 of the Climate Change Act, which refers directly to the Schedule 1 list and places uh, public duties of public bodies related to climate change of people on that list would therefore not apply uh, to you. Would you nonetheless uh, feel that that would be something which you would voluntarily wish to sign up uh, to, uh, given the, the kind of activities that you undertake, and that bodies that remain part of the public sector and are undertaking identical functions uh, would be covered by Section 44 of the Climate Change Act in relation to public in relation to uh, duties of public bodies on climate change? I think uh, um, I can only speak for, for us. I mean, we've been sort of favour. We've, 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 in my previous company, we had ISO 14001, which is yeah. uh, something that we, we, we would look to adopt within Inverclyde as well in the time. So uh, I think the answer is yes. That's Any helpful. Thank so. you. Anyone else wish to comment on that? Highly technical question. <laughs> But Mr. Van Gogh managed it. Um, I wonder if I could ask Ms. Smith, um, in terms of uh, local authorities and vocal, uh, what role do you think that you can play in helping ALIOs meet these FOI requirements? Um, can I just start by stating that um, vocal uh, feels that um, the uh, ALIOs should be uh, included under the FOIA le legislation because um, the vast majority of them, in fact, if not all, uh, came from local authority service provision and therefore were covered by FOICES and therefore the move to uh, the creation of ALIOs, we think that it should continue on and it should be open and transparent and any um, ALIO that is out there that's doing culture and leisure should in fact want to be transparent and want to actually can take this on. So um, and I'm going to be very rude here and say I can't quite remember your, your exact I, I, question. I asked uh, how can local oh. authorities and vocal help um, ALIOs meet the provisions of the, of the Act? Uh, well, all local authorities now have an officer, if not full-time, or a team on FOISAs. And what we are suggesting is that ALIOs are obviously all connected with a local or multiple local authorities. And the local authority FOISA officer could actually provide assistance and training, as well as vocal 
because we represent obviously quite a range of different organisations, we could also provide help, assistance and training. I think the big thing is that when, especially when a new ALIO is established, the largest percentage of the staff are ex-local authority. They're used to FOISAs, they've already done them, they know the processes. It's not a huge leap for them to then be able to take that on. So it would be tapping in to the local authority FOISA officer, what training vocal could give, and officers within the new ALIOs or the existing ALIOs that have experience of FOISAs. Mr Stevenson, do you want to come back? No, no. Uh, Stuart McMillan, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, just uh, I'll state at the outset that I'm a regular user of Inverclyde Leisure uh, Facilities. Uh, also to stay in the area. Um, but, the, but we received a, a briefing uh, from the Campaign for Freedom of Information in Scotland. Uh, and uh, in uh, one of the, the, the paragraphs that they, they highlight, it's actually uh, from the, the Audit Scotland report that was published uh, recently, uh, entitled uh, Arms Length External Organisations, Are You Getting It Right? Uh, and what, one of the paragraphs, certainly in that report, uh, states, ALIOs by their nature are one step removed from council control and, as a result, governance and financial arrangements can be complex. Uh, there is a risk service users and citizens have less input and influence over how services are provided. Uh, with, uh, with Audit Scotland um, stating uh, that, um, surely um, there actually is a, uh, is a legitimate reason for ALIOs to, uh, to then be uh, included uh, within the Freedom of Information legislation. I've got no further comment than the, the um, than what we've written, really. So, uh, um, obviously, if it's the decision of uh, the committee that we we take part in the freedom of information, then we will. So, yeah. do you have anything to add, Mr. Given? No, I agree. With okay. Mr. Sure. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, just uh, one other point, just it's regarding the, uh, also the, the, the submission from Inverclyde Leisure, uh, and it's one of the points we discussed earlier regarding the, uh, the pool temperature readings. Um, can, can you provide me with a bit more information in terms of actually how this takes place uh, and, and how you actually uh, then uh, gather that information and, and how you store the information? Yeah, I think um, currently the, the so it is an example, but those sorts of examples can be quite. Uh, uh, they can take. They can take some time. So, um, the pool tests are done um, in the uh, first aid room. They're done five times a day. So we keep an. We can uh, keep an update of the pool readings, the pH, the chlorine, etc., to make sure that it's safe for the customer to use. So there's uh, one sheet, five done five times a day. Um, that is then done every day of the year, including Christmas, New Year, everything, to make sure that the pool is, is up to date. Now, I'm not sure how long people can go back for, but if, for example, they ask for a pool test reading for some reason to go back five years, that could be time consuming. Is that information then uh, inserted into an electronic system, or is um, it just unfortunately maintained on paper? No, no, it's all paper. It's all paper. Hmm. Most of the stuff is paper. We're changing a lot of stuff over at the moment to electronic, but there's a lot of paper stuff uh, still going on. If that information was uh, put onto an electronic uh, system, uh, then if, uh, if the, these regulations uh, were to pass uh, and a, an FOI request came in, um, I take it would be a lot easier to then supply the information as compared to... Yeah, I suppose retrospectively paper. we'd have to scan it in so sure. it's the same sort of type of um, uh, uh, pressure, but... Um, in the future, we, we are looking at electronic systems to make our lives a little bit easier anyway. So um, in the future, that may be easier to sure. deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Wilson, Just please. a supplementary to that question, line of question from Mr McMillan. The, the pool readings, uh, how long do you have to keep them by law? For environmental service, the health services. There is isn't uh, because I, I'm, I'm there, assuming that there is a, a reporting yeah, mechanism. Yeah, there's not a stip. There's not stip. I don't think there's a stipulation on that. I think it's to to do with our policy on it. So we, we could, for example, say three years. I'm, I'm not sure that there is a complete stipulation for that, um, but I'd have to check. So uh, we currently keep them um, for, a, for for what I know. Um, we just keep them indefinitely, but um, I'm not sure about our policy control at the moment. So. so what surprised me, Mr. Van Gogh, is the 
concern that you have about FOI requests, particularly an FOI request mm. about pool readings, if you keep the information indefinitely, then what is the issue about providing information it's that has been requested through an FOI? It's, it's just copying it. It's the time that it takes to, to deal with that, which um, it would take time to deal with copying all that information uh, to or going through that information. It's manual at the moment, so it would... Could you... Tell me how much information you have to provide to your 30% funder, and that is Inverclyde Council, we, we uh, in, your te in terms of the operational running of the leisure services. They attend a, um, uh, a board meeting um, uh, once uh, every six or six times a year, and then we, we provide information uh, on a monthly basis um, just to give them some background on finances, what we're doing in terms of activity, etc within the Inverclyde area. So we have the two, two, two areas, one monthly meeting with them and um, six times a year board meeting, which includes finance, um, anything in terms of development uh, in the area. Do you find those monthly meetings and six times a year reporting onerous in terms of the work these are doing? Um, no, I think we work in partnership with the local authority. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's good to have those and you know, it's a win-win for, for all of us. Convener, what I was trying to get out, Mr. Vango, is the, the issue about how we get how the local authority receives information mm. and how that information would be vastly different from what may be received as an FOI. It's how much it's public. drilled into. You know, the, the examples I gave were, were examples that will put a, an additional strain on resource. Um, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, the information that the local authority gets is, is stuff that we're producing. Uh, anyway um, so it'll be an additional amount of work on top of that ship come here I, I, no I'm, I'm just I, I'm trying to find the words here in terms of uh, trying to understand I wonder if I can maybe help mr. Wilson in some regards can you tell us what what committee or um, uh, set up in the council actually scrutinizes Inverclyde leisure and the following of the public pound that Inverclyde give. And beyond that, what kind of performance indica indicators we, we, do you have to supply to that committee or body in a regular we basis? We have the monthly client meeting, which is, which is what, you're, what you're talking uh, about. Craig, do you want to go into a bit more uh, detail? Uh, can I stop you there? Because I think there's a difference between the monthly client meeting um, and the point that Mr. Wilson is trying to make. Mm. Um, and that is what body within Inverclyde Council, um, elected member body, oh, actually um, scrutinises Inverclyde leisure and what kind of performance indicator information is supplied to them and would that be very much different from the likely FOIs that you're going to get? We, we have internal audit which we need to do supply significant information to so we go down that line and as, as Kieran said we we have the we, we report it to board and they they will report that also I, I, to I'm, their I'm, so, I'm sorry Mr Given I'm going to stop you again because I realise you will have your own internal audit but there must be um, some committee or set up within Inverclyde Council this that point. looks at Sorry. the following of the public pound of the money that you, Inverclyde Leisure, get. And I would imagine that that body will also uh, be able to scrutinise your key performance indicators to ensure that there is best value being achieved. We uh, there's five members on, uh, uh, on the board, uh, councillors on the board, and we present our KPIs to them on a... On a, on a I, I'm, I'm sorry, you're still missing my point because in other alios elsewhere, uh, you have elected members on the board, yeah. always thus. But within the council itself, or the councils, who are supplying you uh, with the, uh, the funding for you to uh, carry out those services, within those councils, there is normally a committee or a subcommittee uh, tasked with scrutinising... Uh, what is going on uh, in terms of the following of the public pound. 
Edinburgh Clyde Council yeah. who actually does that? There will be that committee. I mean, I'm not, uh, as I say, I'm new to the position. I, if you spoke to the old chief executive, you'd probably be able to give you that. But there will be a committee. Mr. Given, it's the it's the council's internal audit that that, that do the, the checks on us, <coughs> and they would report to that committee. So the uh, it, it would not be the case that uh, you regularly would have to supply information directly to a council committee or actually appear in front of that committee uh, to talk about what you're doing at that moment in time? As, as personally, we, we don't appear before that committee, but internal audit and do the audit on us on a regular basis during the year. And that information, there, there, is, there is regular correspondence with the council regarding these kind of procedures. Okay, I find that interesting. Mr Wilson, do you just, want to come back? Just Sorry. to come back briefly, convener, is well, one of the issues that Mr Vango raised was the issue about the data inputting of the, say, five pool tests a day, and that you're, you keep that at the present moment in hard copy rather than putting it, recording it electronically. What would be the difference for Inverclyde Leisure and actually inputting that information electronically <coughs> rather than... Because what Mr. Vango has expressed a concern that if somebody made an FOI request that said, I want the information from uh, September 2010 about the pool tests that were carried out on the 4th of September. At the present moment, what you're saying is you then need to go and find the hard copy and then photocopy the hard copy uh, before you could actually provide that. And it's the time and effort that it would take to go and search that out. Surely if you kept the information electronically, it would be a case of tapping a couple of buttons on a computer and printing off the information rather than having to send somebody off to find the archives uh, to get that information. We are, sorry, we are currently looking at an electronic system for that. We, we had um, someone in to present to us the other day, so it's something that we, we, we realise that we we need as a, an organisation, so that would make it easier. Would that include all the information that you think may be applicable to, or may be subject to an FOI? Yeah, from, from my reckon, I, I think it would cover most, I would have thought, would you think, Graham? I think it's very difficult to comment, because it's all if, buts and maybes <clears throat> about what we're going to get asked. But if we, I think our point we're trying to make is that we need to set our organisation up to that extent, to be able to co to deal with FOIs, having worked in councils before, I know what's involved in that. We're obviously, because we were different, we will set ourselves up that way if it's passed, but it's getting us to that position of being able to do that. That's our issue at the moment. I think a lot of the organisations, councils have, as, as rightly has been said, have one person employed to deal with those um, those issues. So maybe we'll have to look at someone, maybe not full time, but part time to to deal with freedom of information requests. Mr. Convener, Mr. Given, I think, has given the answer that was eventually coming to. And that is the, the question about the public perception of Inverclyde Leisure. And I look at the headed paper that you made your submission on, and in the bottom left hand corner, it says, best local authority fitness gym in the UK. For many of the public, they don't understand or realise that there is a difference between the alio that has been created to deliver leisure services and the local authority, particularly if you send out in your headed paper, best local authority gym in the UK. Uh, clearly, people will make FOI requests and will expect to have those FOI requests honoured, as they would do if they made that FOI request to a local authority or another public body. Any I, I, no, I, I agree with that. There is okay. obviously a perception that, um, that, that I've not had that in lots of the organisations that I work with, that you know, we're, we would be part of the council because of that. Okay, I've got a number of people now. Richard Baker next, please. Thank you, Rina. Um, can I ask uh, Meryl Smith, firstly, um, are you aware of any local authorities which have expressed concern either at the proposal itself or at their ability to help ALIOs deal with the new requirements they'll be, um, they'll be under uh, as, through coming under this legislation? Uh, we're not aware of anybody that's um, shown any uh, worry about it. 
Um, the point I would also make is a lot of the alios, because of their now uh, the uh, mechanism they're set up, they already fall under the uh, FOI legislation right. and are undertaking it. The wholly owned bodies like the SKIOs and such like, and those some of them have made the decision they wanted to do that anyway. So they're already covered and are undertaking it. Now, perhaps partially answers was, was going to be a follow, my follow-up question. Perhaps Mr. Spittle might have liked to comment and comment on it as well. But obviously, there is uh, that there are there are future plans or intentions, at least, to bring a number of different public bodies under the gambit of FOI legislation. Seem to be starting off with with alios. I mean, do you think it is even given uh, your comments there about those already implementing the um, uh, the, the, the legislation that they're, they're taking first ahead of, for example, housing associations and other bodies? Is it right that they should be coming, you know? Uh, along the line uh, ahead of those other organisations in terms of coming under the, the gambit of the bill? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'd agree with that. I think so. The alios need to come first because they're a special case, as I said earlier, because of the way they're governed. Um, I'm just looking at this headed paper and it said managing, which is Inverclyde Leisure, it says managing leisure services on behalf of Inverclyde Council. So it's very clear that um, to the public that these organisations are council bodies and everything but name. And in terms of looking at other bodies like housing associations and things next, as long as it was a level playing field, we'd have no problem with that. I mean, I think we said in our submission that our position on FY, and if it is extended to uh, all public services, or it should be done through public contracts, and that would be the fairest way to do it. Okay. So that voluntary organisations who are doing maybe one public service but have a large body of other work that they carry out don't get disproportionately burdened by FY for their other work. Okay. Anne McTaggart, please. Um, so Thanks, Convener. My question has been partly asked. Um, so what, what work have you done in preparation that the FOI extension may well happen? Um, uh, to, 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 yeah, I, I, my, uh, my overall organisation is Sporter, which is, uh, and um, they, they're providing some frameworks for FOI for us. Um, has there been a cost into that? Is there a figure? Um, I, I believe that um, the Sporter Works as a, as a number of organisations, it, 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 well, they will provide that um, for us, the systems and procedures, etc. In terms of resources, we haven't allocated any resources to it yet in terms of, uh, we haven't looked at that, but systems and procedures wise, we've, we, we've got some information from our... Stuart McMillan, please. Uh, thanks. I just want to be helpful if it's okay. Uh, just in terms of the, the committee at the Inverclyde Council that will actually uh, look at and uh, require leisure as the Education and Communities Committee. Okay. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you. It's just a wee technical point. Section 1, brackets 2 of the order, uh, says that the order comes into force on the 1st of uh, April 2014. Um, is it your understanding, therefore, that this amendment will only cover data uh, that are gathered or created post that date? Um, well, from, from my colleagues in sport, I believe that it can be that, that it can be asked for retrospectively. So, um, I, you know, well, I, I, I mean, I'm quite clear that you would probably, given that you'll have the necessary processes in place, wish to be as cooperative as possible for any data that uh, that have been gathered prior to that date. I was merely just see it, because it's not clear to me yeah, yeah. Um, wh whether the legal position mm. uh, is that it would only be data that are gathered after that date but if yeah. that's maybe a matter yeah. for the minister okay uh, margaret mitchell please yeah i wonder if i could ask you about exemptions to foi and also to explore it's mentioned as a, a concern in the inverfide paper commercial uh, sensitivity, if you'd like to, to talk a little bit more to to these exemptions and specifically commercial um, sensitivity. I think the um, the ones that we're talking about uh, within the paper were um, where we might subcontract to uh, another organisation. For example, we have Alds, which is a baker's uh, private company, and they sub they subcontract our our bakers. So. I would have thought that's an exemption because they're a private organisation. Would that be where the, the clause may come in or renegotiating or looking at a future one to say there would be an FOI clause? I think that was um, mentioned somewhere in the contract when it was being um, dealt with and looked at. 
I, I suppose it could be, yeah. Uh -huh. I'd like to, to tease out your concerns about commercial uh, sensitivity. It's something <coughs> I've mixed feelings on. Yes, of course, I, I can understand there will be circumstances where there is commercially sensitive uh -huh. information that is in danger of um, being compromised. Equally, and I very often felt very frustrated that commercial sensitivity was being used as a label to stop quite legitimate information uh, becoming uh, coming into the public domain. So I'd like to tease out from all the panel members your ex um, your um, I idea or um, your knowledge of, of what is exempt and what you think should be exempt um, and what you, you fear won't be exempt um, under if this SSI is passed. I think we should start with Mr Spittle in this one, first of all, since Mrs Mitchell wants uh, opinions um, from all of you. I don't have any additional comments on that, actually. Mrs Smith? Um, I, I, obviously, uh, my experience, uh, personally, of SOIs is from the City Council point of view, and I've not really ever come across one that's given us a, a worry about uh, commercial confidentiality. Obviously, I'm also aware of our... Um, uh, um, Skio in uh, Dundee um, and although they have contracts or whatever um, I do question the level of what's commercial confidentiality what difference it would make it's also I think comes would come down to exactly um, the terminology of how far and I have to say I'm not knowledgeable enough to know what the legislation is saying as to how far it went is it just asking for information in the ALIO or is it asking for contracts that the ALIO has to have information I think that would make a difference could I perhaps ask further information, if you don't have it today, to provide to the Committee of Examples where commercial sensitivity has been cited as a reason for not um, giving the information requested in an FOI? Because I think it's, it's quite useful just to balance this to see how much of a problem it is. Now, in your paper, you, you definitely, in Verclyde, <laughs> um, cite this as a problem. So I'm looking for some more information and meat on the bones. I, I think it's the example in terms of the boards, the bakers, um, uh, how far does it go? Does it, does it extend to stuff that we subcontract or not? I, I, you know, that's, that, I, I don't know the answer to that, that question. Uh, you know, obviously, everything within our LEO, within our trust, is, is, would be uh, uh, access for freedom of information. But does it include contracts that are commercial in their nature we have a we sublease to a crash as well um, another different company or we sublease to a baker so does that come under <coughs> how would that work I don't know I thought there was a mention of rental values yeah which is yeah rental values which is a which is a co contract um, for uh, all the bakers for example uh -huh. but isn't that information that should be in the public domain once the contract has has won mm -hmm. Why shouldn't it be? I don't know. I, I, uh, if the rental value, I, I suppose we, we are, yeah, I suppose we're declaring it as stuff that we're renting out um, as part of it. I, I don't know if the bakers would, would have, or Alds would have an issue with that or not, but we can declare it, we can show it. I don't think it really matters if they do. Um, the fact is the public has a right to know what their money is being spent on. I think the rental value is, is a clear indication of that. Can, can I maybe just comment on, on Inverclyde? That I get a very definite impression this morning that your, your glass has been half empty. And can I say that there's probably an opportunity here for you to look at what you're doing very well, by all accounts, and see this as a very positive thing, that you can be more transparent and open uh, and make it an actual positive thing, that you're releasing more information about what you're doing. It doesn't have to, to all be you know, <laughs> potential problems. OK. Sure. Stevenson, please. Um, I, I just want to convene if it would be useful to go back to what the order actually does. Because... You can do it briefly, Mr Stevenson. No, but I just make the point that in column two, it isn't covering all the activities. It's only covering sections 90 and 163 of the Local Government Act, section 14 of the Planning Act, which is going to matter, and section 20 of the Local Government Act 2003. So it's perfectly clear that some of the things that we've been questioning about would be outside that. It's, in, in other words, it's not about the application of the general uh, rules within the Freedom of Information Act that cover things like commercial confidentiality. It's simply that it, that it appears to me and I would need to look more closely, and others might have to, that there is a specific range of things 
that address. I think what would be very helpful is if there was an indication that in the spirit of openness, that you would not feel yourselves constrained by simply the, the three specific references in column two that is required uh, by, by, by a section five order um, such as this is uh, to, to those. And I think if we can say that, then I think that kind of puts the thing to bed. Okay. Any comment on that? No. Mr. Wilson. Sorry, Commissioner. I've got two brief questions I need to ask. One is the how did and uh, Mr. Van Gogh and Mr. Given might not be able to answer this, but it's just uh, curious. How did the uh, Inverclyde Council deal with FY requests in the past regarding leisure services, and was that not an issue uh, when they transferred to the Alio that was raised with the, the new management of the Can Alio? You answer that, gentlemen. Possibly a comment on that because no. I wasn't. Okay. Maybe a question we'll take up yeah. with Inverclyde Council. And the second question, convener, is who owns the buildings and equipment that are operated by Inverclyde Leisure Services? Buildings are owned by the council and they're uh, leased to us, and uh, the equipment within it we purchase. Um, say it's fitness equipment, we'll do that on a five year basis, ten year basis. I could ask Ms. Smith if that standard for any other local authorities or are you aware of any local authorities who have transferred the buildings and equipment that were there to the alios uh, and the local authority divested themselves of that, those buildings? From, from my own experience and my knowledge of any other council, I'm not aware of any that have actually transferred. That In most cases, the council retains ownership of the buildings and leases them with a contractual agreement, whether that's a management agreement, service level agreement, memorandum of understanding, all sorts of different ways. We have a service agreement in Dundee because we have a SCIO. Um, we retained ownership of some of the major pieces of equipment, uh, the sports equipment, but that was because it was uh, commercially made more sense. But normally other smaller pieces of equipment are part of the lease agreement to the Alia. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, could I thank you all uh, for giving up your time today and giving evidence. Uh, I now suspend the meeting uh, for approximately a couple of minutes for a change of witnesses. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to our second panel. Uh, I would like to welcome Nicola Sturgeon, uh, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities, Andrew Gunn, FOI Officer, Scottish Government Freedom of Information Unit, and Christine Ray, Solicitor, Commercial and Business Services of the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make an opening statement? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm very pleased to be here today to speak in favour of this motion. Um, this is the first time since the Scottish Freedom of Information Act, uh, or FOISA, came into force that coverage of the legislation has been extended beyond public authorities and bodies which are wholly owned by those public authorities. Uh, the proposed order will bring recreational, sporting, cultural or social bodies established or created by local authorities within the scope of FOISA where they're partly or fully financed by a local authority. 
Uh, that will help ensure that the public and others have a right to ask these bodies, which are, of course, delivering public services and receive public funding for information. They'll also have the right to submit requests both under the Freedom of Information uh, Scotland Act and the Environmental Information Scotland regulations. Uh, a draft order was originally consulted on back in 2010. Uh, and following the announcement I made in January of the decision to extend coverage, a revised draft order was circulated to key stakeholders for further comment, uh, including local authorities and the relevant trusts. Um, I'm grateful to the Information Commissioner for her continuing input into this process uh, and also for her willingness to support those trusts being designated by this order uh, to help them prepare for uh, the responsibilities under FOI legislation and, and indeed associated legislation that they'll be taking on. Um, many uh, have argued, and indeed uh, it was one of the recurring themes during the Amendment Act as it progressed through Parliament, that the power uh, that this order is uh, exercising has been unused uh, for too long. Uh, and you know, I, I hear that and I, I think there is a fair consensus uh, in Parliament that that is the case. Uh, I therefore want to underline really the view I expressed uh, during the Amendment Act's progress um, and give the assurance today that I very much see this as an initial order. Uh, I have not ruled out including other arm's length bodies within the scope of FOISA in future. Uh, I think it will be important to monitor the impact on, of FOISA on the trust falling under this order uh, and take that into account when we make decisions about further expansion. Uh, obviously, we also want to hear wider uh, stakeholder views in order to inform proposals in relation to uh, other bodies uh, with a view to extending coverage further in the future. Uh, I would also remind uh, the committee that as a consequence of changes to the legislation introduced by the Amendment Act, uh, ministers are also required to report to the Scottish Parliament every two years on the exercise of the Section 5 power. Uh, that's a real strengthening of the legislation in my view. It makes ministers more accountable for the use or non-use of uh, Schedule 5, um, and I think it does mean uh, that this committee in Parliament more generally has the ability to scrutinise uh, those decisions in future. So I, I think this is a, a good first step in extension of coverage, but I'm sure it's not the last time we'll be sitting here discussing uh, how uh, much wider the freedom of information legislation should go. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we have uh, a briefing paper in front of us from the Campaign for Freedom of Information Scotland. Uh, who talk of uh, broken promises because there was a, uh, a belief that uh, that these powers would be extended. And uh, I think that Jim Wallace, when he was a minister, outlined the range of bodies that he expected uh, to be included in 2002. Um, you've said today uh, that you see this as the first part of, uh, of an extension. Uh, could, could we maybe uh, get an indication from you of... of whether you believe that um, this is the right way to go incrementally to make sure that all of this works and to look at the impacts uh, that there will be on, on other bodies? Um, the short answer to that question would be yes, I, I do take that view. I mean, I would say firstly, and I indicated this in my opening remarks, that you know, I, I recognise the consensus that Schedule uh, 5, Section 5, sorry, has not been uh, used uh, before now. Um, I can't speak and I'm not uh, responsible for decisions or uh, lack of decisions that Jim Wallace took when he was uh, the Deputy First Minister. Uh, but I think today we are setting out a clear direction of travel. I think it is important that we uh, move forward uh, with firstly a, a willingness to extend the principles of transparency uh, through extension of the coverage of freedom of information. But that secondly, we do so in a way that allows us to assess impact in organisations, learn lessons as we take decisions about the future. So I would you know, anticipate laying a further, uh, or at least opening consultation towards a further order uh, next year that would look at P perhaps other uh, arm's length bodies that are not covered uh, by this order. I know there has been discussion in the past about uh, housing associations by contractors uh, working for local authorities and public agencies. I think there is a continuing debate around that, but we need to move forward in a way that allows us to assess impact, learn lessons and make sure that we're taking the right decisions. We heard an evidence from Inverclyde Leisure just a, a few minutes ago uh, that they were a bit wary uh, of it, FOISA because of commercial sensitivities and then were they gave a, a brief outline of, of, of what they were actually uh, afraid of. Uh, could you maybe tell us in terms of commercial sensitivities um, how uh, 
local authorities, for example, uh, deal with that under the current Freedom of Information Act? Well, there are a range of exemptions under the Freedom of Information legislation that allow public authorities to withhold information if they have a uh, good, sound, uh, legislation-backed reason for doing so. And there is a, a process under the legislation that allows people seeking information to ask for reviews and go through a, an appeals process. I didn't hear uh, the verbal evidence, uh, the oral evidence there of Inverclyde Leisure, but I did read the, the note that they sent to the committee. I, I don't um, accept uh, that their concerns are well-founded. I mean, one of the points I would make is that, you know, some similar organisations in my own uh, part of the country, Glasgow Life, because it's wholly owned uh, by Glasgow City Council, is already covered by freedom of information. So, in a sense, uh, this order is bringing consistency in terms of these kinds of, of bodies. There's a great deal of help and assistance available from the Information Commissioner in helping bodies like Inverclyde Leisure, uh, who are newly becoming subject to freedom of information, to uh, exercise their responsibilities and to do so in a way that uh, puts an emphasis on openness and transparency and ensures that the burdens are not disproportionate in the way that they've uh, expressed concerns about. So, you know, I, I think what we're doing here is, is right in terms of consistency, but also right in terms of extending that principle of openness and transparency. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell, please. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I wonder if you, you could explain why the government has prioritised the alleyos for recreational, um, sporting, cultural and social facilities first. It kind of goes back to my previous answer to, to Kevin Stewart in that you know, we, we had a situation where there was uh, is an inconsistency in terms of you know, Glasgow Life, for example, I'm using that just as one example, is subject to freedom of information, but other uh, bodies are not. So this uh, brings a, a consistency across the recreational, cultural and social uh, arm's length bodies. And, and that's why we had previously consulted uh, to include these bodies as well. And that's why we've decided uh, to start there. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, that does not mean we're going to stop there. Um, it just means that we've uh, started in a, a direction of travel here that we want to take step by step. Have you an indication of how many will be covered um, under the SSI? How many would still to be covered well, or potentially could be covered? I think... If you're talking specifically about this order, this is a class designation. So, as you know from the, the terms of the order, we're not listing bodies in the order. Now, the reason for that um, is, is twofold. Firstly, uh, the freedom of information legislation is very much based on function of, of organisations. And secondly, uh, if you start listing organisations as opposed to doing a class designation, then it quickly will become out of date if new organisations are set up and you have to have another order to, to add to it. But in terms of uh, the uh, our view of trust expected to be covered by this order, there's uh, 23 of them. Uh, obviously, ultimately, if any of these bodies think that they shouldn't be covered, that would be for the Information Commissioner to, to reach a view on. And if other classes were um, included... Have you got a rough idea of how many organisations we'll be talking about? You mean that are not included in this not sport order? Not I, don't, I don't have a figure of... Because you will appreciate, uh, apart from anything else, it's a moving uh, situation as, as bodies are, are set up by, by local authorities. So I don't have a figure for uh, the number of organisations that potentially could be covered by freedom of inf information. That would depend on the particular classes that you uh, decided to uh, extend coverage to. Mm -hmm. And in, and in what order? Okay. Um, in terms of the application of the legislation, will it um, be just new alleos or will it be retrospective? Well, in terms of the... Uh, Contractual arrangements, I suppose. Let, let me try and uh, answer that in two parts. Firstly, the passage of this order is retrospective in terms of the information held. So it's not just information held from the date of the passage of the order that comes within coverage. It, you know, once these bodies are, are within the scope of, of the Act, then information they hold historically can be requested under freedom of information. Um, I said 23 uh, organisations that we consider to be covered by this. That is as of now. If, if a new organisation is set up by a local authority mm. or a combination of local authorities after this comes into to force, if they fit within the class designation, they would also be covered, uh, even although they hadn't been in existence when this order passes. That goes back to the point we're not listing organisations in the order. We're giving a class of organisations that are covered, so new ones that are set up within that class would be covered by this order. 
So I suppose I'm trying to get the contracts if there is likely to be information currently not available and on a voluntary basis perhaps not given, but might now be subject to the, the SSI and um, information that should be released in a well, contract. I mean, a that, that goes perhaps. In, well, these organisations will become subject to freedom of information. As any organisation that is subject to freedom of information, the freedom of information legislation has a number of grounds on which information can be withheld, and the organisation would have to argue that one of those grounds applied to it. But these organisations will be subject to freedom of information in the same way as the Scottish Government is or local authorities currently are. So um, I suppose the short answer is you don't foresee any real problem with contracts that are already in existence I'm with not, this new... I'm not, I, I'm not quite sure I'm understanding what, what Well, there might be the terms, terms of the contract. Of it was agreed certain information would not be released. This information could now come under the terms of the SSI as being pertinent to be released. Well, all information held by these organisations will be covered by the scope of FOI, whether it's releasable or not will depend on whether or not it falls within one of the exemptions in the FOI legislation. But it is all of the information held by these organisations, uh, not just from the date of this order, but historically as well, is covered by the scope of the, the legislation. Could you give, um, I certainly would appreciate a little bit more information on, on exemptions, just exactly what are we talking about, well, other I, than broadheading? I mean, the, the exemptions are, are laid down in the legislation. I don't have it in front of me, but the kind of, well, we do have it in front of us here. Um, you can get me to the next step. But the, the kind of classes of exemption are, you know, things that uh, may be commercially uh, confidential, things that are... Uh, we have them here actually. Okay. Exempt information part two. I'll just read you the list. Uh, information otherwise uh, accessible, prohibitions on disclosure, uh, information intended for future publication. So if, you know, if, if I take this from the government's perspective, if we get an FOI asking us for statistics that are due to be published routinely six weeks from now, then we can exempt the information on the basis that it's going to be published uh, later on. Um, I'm just giving you some examples here. Prejudice to the effective conduct of public affairs, national security and defence, commercial interests uh, is, is one of them, um, confidentiality, court records, personal information. Uh, these are the kind of, but the whole list is at part two of the Freedom of Information uh, Act. That's helpful. And in your opening statement, Cabinet Secretary, you, 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 you pointed out it would be a positive, it would be more transparent, and I, I certainly agree with that, especially under the term of commercial sensitivity. I don't know if you heard some of the evidence that we had before, but I certainly have a bit of an axe to, to grind in, in very often local authorities saying things are or a public body saying things are commercially sensitive when they, they blatantly aren't and withholding information. And I'm wondering, and I think you'll find that members of the public very often have the same um, kind of complaint and will be looking at this legislation as a well, way to, to get the information that I think it's, may previously have been withheld. Right, so I was I wondering think, if there yeah, would be I think, any I think implications you have to, about I think, that. I think we're in danger here of making a kind of fundamental misunderstanding of what this... Uh, order is doing. This order is not changing the class of information uh, that is covered by freedom of information, nor is it changing any of the potential exemptions. It's extending uh, the range of bodies that are subject to freedom of information. So I think that's it's absolutely vital that we're clear on that. In terms of the classes of information that are covered or the potential exemptions, that is laid down in the primary legislation. It is also the case, as you are aware, that anybody individual uh, or organisation requesting information from a public authority, if the answer is no, we are not giving you that information because we're exempting it on whatever ground, uh, there is a, a process of uh, requesting a review to that decision and then there is the potential to take an appeal uh, to the Freedom of Information Commissioner and then you can go to court uh, as well. If, Potentially, So that is laid down. This order is not changing the fundamental process of requesting information or the, the range of classes of information that is covered. It is taking what is in the Freedom of Information Act and extending it to a broader range of organisations. I understand that. My final question, therefore, is, Cabinet Secretary, would you be in favour of promoting or looking at the idea of a Freedom of Information Clause being included in contracts for these alios so that perhaps we don't have to go down the more expensive route of the appealing and things that these things are ironed out more clearly because 
there are disputes, there's no doubt about that, and there's a lot of people very unhappy about whether or not something is actually commercial sensitive. So it seems to me there's an opportunity here to look at a freedom of information clause when contracts are being um, negotiated. I'm, I mean, I'm very open to looking at anything that promotes transparency, but you know, I think we're talking about the law here, and you know, we've just had a Freedom of Information Amendment Act go go through Parliament. Um, I, I'm open to you know further suggestions about how we can promote transparency through, uh, you know, for example, you know, al albeit that housing associations are not currently covered uh, by freedom of information, the uh, Scottish Housing Charter uh, is intended to promote greater transparency uh, in the housing sector. Uh, I think in terms of procurement, we should look at how we uh, promote greater transparency. So I'm, I'm absolutely open to anything that, that does that. But I think we've got to be very clear here today that we're talking about the legal framework. And of course, it's the legal framework, um, and in, in particular, the, the act of uh, primary legislation that governs the freedom of information environment. As a former Solicitor's Cabinet Secretary, you'll know that um, lawyers have various interpretations of the law. All I was trying to do is suggest something that perhaps would make it absolutely quite clear and sure, but, but, oh, I'm not arguing with that. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be quite sympathetic. I'm just making the point that ultimately whether something's covered by freedom of information is, well, in the first instance, down to the interpretation of the, uh, the person being asked for the information and then, obviously, the Freedom of Information Commissioner and ultimately the courts. Thank, Thank you. you. Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. What additional resources, if any, could the Scottish Government make available to support some of the kind of voluntary organisations and the voluntary sector in gearing up to comply with the FOI Act? Given some of the evidence this morning, at, well, I know that that was only one in particular, they haven't um, started or, or kind of allocated any resources to it so far. I mean, th this uh, order doesn't per se uh, apply to the, the voluntary sector. I mean, obviously, some of these bodies that may be covered may consider themselves to be third sector organisations. In terms of uh, assisting organisations to be ready to comply with freedom of information, I mean, the Information Commissioner uh, herself has uh, said that she will uh, do what... Uh, what she can and what is necessary to assist organisations in, in being ready to comply. I think local authorities uh, who already comply with this legislation are also uh, well placed to give appropriate assistance to organisations that will be uh, coming under the ambit of the legislation for the first time. But you know, I would go back to a point I made earlier on. I think it's you know it's incumbent on these organisations to organise themselves mm -hmm. in a way. We're, we're giving plenty lead-in time here uh, in in terms of the commencement of some of these changes. Uh, so I think it's incumbent on the organisations themselves to do what requires to be done to fulfil uh, the requirements of the law. And I would you know, repeat the point I made earlier on, that some organisations that are uh, very similar to the likes of Inverclyde uh, Leisure are already and have been for some considerable time subject to freedom of information. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, two matters. I just want to explore a little bit further the scope uh, as it applies to the alloys. Uh, looking at uh, the schedule in this order at, uh, and the description, um, at B it says whose functions on behalf of those authorities include, and then there's a list, uh, and the, the, the columns uh, essentially refer to tourism, public libraries, museums, art galleries, provision of recreational, sporting, cultural and social facilities um, and uh, Section 20 of the Local Government Act is simply about how directions may be given. Um, so there is a very specific list of activities that form part of what the ALEOs may do uh, that are covered by this provision. So let me just identify an example that an ALEO might do and test whether you think this would be included. It might be that an ALEO would consider, um, as, uh, as part of its activity, that given the kind of customers it has and the needs, that it might want to start in these difficult times to offer advice on debt. Um, that would not be covered, it seems to me, having looked at the relevant acts, to be covered by the descriptions in uh, column two of this order. Would that not then be the case that that activity 
uh, of the allele would not be covered by this, and that therefore not all the information that an allele might hold is actually going to be covered by this order. Well, apologies if I haven't expressly made what I thought would have been kind of implicitly understood that you know the the, the, the information covered here in terms of these alleles is what is you know described as you've described it in the order. What you've described there, I mean, I, you've given me an example that, you know, I would want to, you know, have the ability to, you know, get legal uh, minds to look at to see whether in that particular circumstance that bit of the alleles work would be covered by uh, freedom of information. It may be that it's not because there are alleles just now doing economic development or regeneration work Indeed. that are not covered by this order. And they may be, you know, the type of organisation we choose to consult on making subject to a future order. So I don't want to you know, give you an absolutely definitive yes or no answer to that question uh, without, you know, having a chance but to look at it. But, you know, the, it's very clear in terms of the schedule to the order, A, what alleos are covered uh, and what functions of those alleos uh, are covered. Cabinet Secretary, I wasn't mm -hmm. actually pursuing the issue of debt, merely the issue that there will be activities that alleos undertake you know, I, I that are not that. covered. I just wanted it, to, because it appeared some some of the earlier discussion that it might appear okay. that it's thought it all covered. Yeah. I was, was I was assuming we, we understood that we were kind of talking about the, the functions laid down in this schedule, but just in, so that I'm not you know inadvertently uh, giving another impression, it's the functions of these alleos laid down in the schedule to the order that would be covered. It, there may well be other functions that are not covered by this, and it may be that in future work we would want sure. to broaden uh, that uh, function that, that, base That's fine. Well. That's sufficient for my purpose, just to get that on the record. The other thing uh, was just a, a, a brief thing. Because this order is uh, not capable of being made under Section 4 of the Freedom of Information Act because it's not a government body, etc., etc., the, the alleos. It has to be made under Section 5. Therefore, um, these bodies are not added to the Schedule 1 list. Um, and therefore, uh, Section 44 uh, of the... Um, sorry, uh, and therefore Section 44 of the Climate Change Act uh, which relates to the duties of public bodies related to climate change, which specifically refers to the schedule in the Freedom of Information Act, will not include in law uh, these, these bodies. Uh, would you, Cabinet Secretary, be prepared to look at whether there are ways in which, um, and I don't see any order-making powers that make this very easy in, in looking at the legislation, um, that to, when we extend freedom of information uh, to bodies that are not covered by Section 4 of FY but by Section 5, that we are able to include them in the duties that would otherwise uh, apply to public bodies in relation to climate change public duties. I think with, without getting sort of deep into the, the technicalities of this, I am not... Uh, I'm not of the view that what you have just outlined there is, is strictly accurate um, in that these bodies would not be covered by obligations under the, the climate change legislation, but I'm, I'm happy either directly to the member or through uh, the convener to respond in writing to that particular well, point. Well, if, if, if I may, what the Climate Change Act says, a public body means a pub Scottish public authority within the meaning of Section 3.1.8 okay, well, of the Freedom of Information. Uh, I'm, I'm happy Mr. to Stevenson. provide some clarification on, on that particular point. I don't think it yep. affects the passage no, no, of this no, no, no. Act, it's, but I'm happy to provide that. On your broader point, I, I think, yes, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to address the broader, broader point, because obviously if we are uh, using Section 5 to extend the coverage of the yep. Act, then we want that to be, yep. you know, extending the coverage in all the ways that you would want That's that coverage helpful, to be extended. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Baker, please. Uh, my question really builds on the, the question that the convener asked you, Cabinet Secretary, because uh, this, uh, this change is significant but narrow in terms of the number of organisations which will be involved. And I think that's why the questions come up about why cover alios first in terms of extending legislation. But you referred to the consultation paper you expect to publish next year. Do you think that will uh, cover a significantly broader range of organisations who may come under the gambit of FY legislation? Um, it will. Um, I'm not going to today, because uh, it would you know, get the process around the wrong way to start to list the kind of organisations that will be covered in that. But you know, by definition, it will be broader than what we're looking at today. And you know, I think it is a, an opportunity to, to go you know, quite a way broader uh, than this. 
Um, I've explained why we started with these uh, particular alleos. You know, of course, it's open to anybody to say it's not going far or, or fast enough. I would simply repeat the point I made earlier on that you know this is the first government that has extended the coverage of the Act through uh, use of Section 5. So I think the Commissioner, I, I, I apologise in advance if I'm about to misquote her, I don't think I am, uh, she described it herself as a great start. So I, I would be happy to concur with that uh, interpretation, saying it's a good start but recognising there's further to go and you know, certainly given the commitment that uh, we'll look to bring forward a further consultation next year that will widen the scope further. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. We heard in the earlier evidence from Inverclyde Leisure the possibility of or the ambition of the Chief Executive of Inverclyde Leisure who wanted to extend the services they provide as an organisation. And I think the example we gave was to provide leisure services in Aberdeen. What would be the situation in terms of FOI, if these alios started commercial offshoots from those alios, and would those commercial offshoots be subject to uh, FOI? They would be if they're wholly owned by the the body in question, and if the functions, and you know, it goes back to some extent to the uh, discussion I've just had with Mr. Stevenson, if the functions are captured by the schedule. Uh, here, then yes, they would be covered by, by freedom of information. But you know, obviously, the, the definitive answer to those questions can't always be answered in the hypothetical. You know, you'd, you'd need a kind of concrete example of what a particular body was doing to be absolutely certain whether, in my view, it would be covered by uh, the the provisions we're looking at today. The example I would give your cabinet secretary is if the alio was to go into a partnership, say, with a current private leisure provider, one of the major okay. private leisure providers, and going to uh, form a partnership with that, would the, the ALIO part of that partnership be subject to FOI or would the... I'm just trying to find out whether or not there are ways that some organisations, some ALIOs oh. who come under this, may f try and find loopholes to exempt themselves from FOI uh, provision. Well, can I say firstly, I would hope that bodies didn't do that, and if bodies do start to do that, then that will certainly be a material factor in our decisions about where we go uh, next with, with this. So that would be the, the first point I would make. I, I don't think bodies should be trying to organise themselves in a way that gets them out of uh, their obligations under freedom of information. I think in terms of the example you gave, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm responding here to hypothetical yeah. examples, and I would caveat you know, that, uh, my answer with that straight away, but you, know, you couldn't they couldn't bring within the ambit of freedom of information uh, legislation a body, for example, the private company, that, that wouldn't otherwise be subject to, to the freedom of information legislation. The uh, Inverclyde leisure, in terms of you know, its functions, would still be covered, but you know, they couldn't sort of extend that to cover a, a private company. But you know, we'll obviously be very, uh, very uh, interested in, in any body that is trying to organise itself in a way that is designed to get it out of freedom of information and would uh, look to address that in future orders if, if we considered that would, was necessary. But I would hope that wouldn't happen. <laughs> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I have no more questions. So if we can now move on to uh, Agenda Item 4, uh, which is formal consideration of the motion to approve the SSI that we've just taken oral evidence on. Does any member wish to speak in the debate? No. Uh, in which case, um, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to formally move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you. Um, uh, can I ask the committee if they agree the motion? Agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. If I could maybe suspend uh, the meeting until 10.20, please, for a change of witnesses.
Thank you. Agenda item five uh, today uh, is an oral evidence session on two bills which are currently undergoing parliamentary consideration. These are the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Bill uh, and the Children and Young People Scotland Bill. These bills are currently being considered by the Health and Sport Committee and the Education and Culture Committee, respectively. Uh, while this committee is not a formal secondary committee for the consideration of these bills, each of these bills may have a significant impact on the functions of local government in Scotland in relation to the delivery of both adult and children's services. In keeping with the presiding officer's agenda for more focused and joined up working by committees, we have decided to undertake this one-off oral evidence session on both bills with some key witnesses and report our findings to the lead committees. The aim of this session is to ensure these bills are scrutinised from a local government perspective, as well as to deliver a joined-up scrutiny of cross-cutting legislation by the committees of the Parliament. This session will also inform the committee's ongoing work on, of the implementation of the Christie Commission principles across the public sector in Scotland. The witnesses before us today have made written submissions which members have in papers. We have also received a further 13 written evidence papers from other organisations, as well as having regards to the written submissions made to the lead committee, committees considering these bills. Uh, can I welcome uh, Jim Carroll, uh, the Child Health Commissioner with NHS Ayrshire and Arran, Dr Anne Mullen uh, from GPs at the Deep End, Eddie Fraser, Head of Community Care at East Ayrshire Council, uh, Carol Kirk, Corporate Director for Education and Skills at North Ayrshire Council, and Mary Taylor, Chief Executive of the Scottish Federation of Housing Association uh, and member of the Housing Coordinating Group. Uh, can I ask the witnesses if they want to make some very brief statements? We're rather short in time, but does anyone want to, to give a wee statement to begin with? Yes, I would welcome the opportunity, if I may. Ms Taylor, yeah, um, go ahead. I, I, I note the word brief, so I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. I, I think it's fair to say that Housing seems to be absent from this debate about integration of health and social care uh, at the present time, and so we were delighted to be able to have an opportunity to speak to the committee today. Um, the housing sector, on, on whose behalf I'm speaking, not just for the SFHA today, um, supports the broad aims of joined up working and improved outcomes uh, in relation to health and well-being. Um, we see ourselves as already making significant contributions to outcomes about healthier living, independent living, and positive outcomes for individuals and communities. So we support the broad thrust of what's uh, happening, but the focus on institutional and structural aspects of integration without reference to housing um, creates a risk which, in our view, this committee could do something um, to address. Um, there's virtually no mention in the papers, for example, for today's meeting of housing other than from the housing coordinating group, and maybe that's what you would expect. Um, but I'm here to make the case um, for revising proposals as they stand um, to allow um, the housing sector to, uh, to, be, to allow better strategic engagement with the housing sector um, on, from, strategic housing commission, from strategic commissioning down to locality planning at whatever scale uh, that turns out to be. And, and I would conclude my opening remarks by saying that unless the... the uh, housing sector, which has experience of strategic planning and practical capacity and an appetite uh, to make a contribution on the ground, and the, what the, the risk uh, is that there will be poorer quality outcomes and at higher cost than might have been achieved with housing involvement at an earlier stage. It's not what we want for ourselves or for our older generations and relatives. Um, so that, I'd, I'd like to conclude on that point. Uh, thank you, Ms Taylor. I think that's extremely useful, and maybe I'll follow up on that to begin with. Uh, obviously, there were moves in the past to create homes for life, uh, but we now have seen uh, various welfare reform changes with uh, more to come, um, which kind of impede uh, that uh, ambition of homes for life 
things like the bedroom tax, etc. Uh, those powers, of course, we don't have in this Parliament at this moment in time. So again, that's probably an impediment to, to what you would like to see. Would you wish to comment on that, uh, please? I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on the bedroom tax in the interests of time. Um, uh, I could go on at great length, but uh, all I would say is that the sector, this doesn't, Im this doesn't completely undermine the sector's capacity. It does erode it, at, uh, certainly, and we're working to address that. But there are all sorts of issues, particularly around the engagement of the housing sector in terms of strategic planning, uh, through the local housing strategy and through housing contribution statements, which, uh, it, uh, as I said earlier, it would be a, a, a risk to the objectives and goals of this exercise of integration uh, to, to miss the opportunity to involve housing in those things. But uh, it would be fair to say that uh, these changes uh, really do away with the concept of homes for life. Uh, uh, not, not necessarily. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, there are a number of people in, affected by the bedroom tax, um, but there are a number of people who are not affected by the bedroom tax, and there is no requirement on anybody to move um, as, as such. I mean, the English regime for housing policy is quite different from the Scottish regime for housing policy. And uh, Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil, when Minister for Housing, was quite clear that there was no suggestion that, that uh, uh, the Homes for Life notion um, was going to be done away with. But, but I think I would, I would make the point that the... In speaking for the housing sector, I'm not just speaking for social housing providers. Our housing coordinating group involves people who work right across the spectrum, uh, including working on care and repair projects, helping elderly owner occupiers to undertake repairs to their homes to engage services that they need to keep them living independently in their homes. This isn't just about social housing. OK, um, thank you. There are obviously high expectations uh, f uh, for both of these bills and, uh, and what services uh, can, uh, can be expected to achieve. Um, obviously, people are looking for uh, improvements once these bills come into place. Uh, when do you think that uh, these benefits will, will start uh, to be demonstrated? If I could start with Mr Caro, please. I believe the benefits are already becoming manifest and, and are, have been uh, for some time. I think children's services, if, in the broadest sense, um, have been working towards a very similar agenda in terms of integration and making sure that or understanding that um, by working together we can produce better outcomes for children and young people. The challenge to us is measuring the impact, for example, of the Early Years Collaborative over a longer period of time. We're quite used to, as public organisations, looking for um, short-term gains, gains over one, two or three years. What we're not used to is looking at um, someone who will be born today and the benefits or the reduction in the uptake of services in later life. Um, I think Children's Service has been working hard on this agenda and we hope very much that the two new bills will go some way to supporting that uh, new process. Thank you. Dr Mullen, please. Um, I think, in, just from a general practice perspective and working in deprived areas, we haven't seen benefits yet. Um, and we're working from a slightly different standpoint from other services here that are represented. Um, I mean, the Deep End does think there's potential in this legislation, and uh, we would like to uh, explore some of that potential with the uh, Scottish Government. And we have outlined very specific proposals where we feel we could make a difference and should make a difference. But that does need to be um, supported with all the things that were suggested in our proposal, such as the additional time for consultations we need working with very comorbid people in very deprived areas, um, support for the serial counter in general practices, which is quite key to the holistic care and long-term care of people, um, attack staff, we'd very specifically name social work, addiction workers, um, health visitors, um, a national enhanced service for vulnerable children, and the list goes on, um, and we have outlined them, you can access those documents. Um, if the proposals are incorporated and recognised, we feel that general practice can certainly play its part with our other partners in primary care. In terms of uh, increased consultation time and having uh, visited some doctor surgeries during the course of recess, everybody thinks we take long holidays, but it's actually more work. Um, uh, again, uh, there was some plea for that from surgeries that I uh, mentioned, but your contract is governed by um, the deal that's done with the UK government, is that correct? 
Um, I think there is some scope now, perhaps. Um, I mean, I'm not involved in contract negotiations at all. That would be through the BMA. But there is some scope, I think, or there's some appetite to, to revisit the contract, perhaps look at what could be more appropriate for our NHS up here. I mean, primary care in Scotland and England bear no resemblance to each other anymore. Um, we feel that primary care is far more protected up here, and, and we want to develop the role of general practice, particularly in the inequalities agenda. We feel it's very important for us to get involved. So you, you would say that it would be best for the BMA to negotiate with the Scottish Government rather than the Westminster Government of, uh, over many of these things? That's just my opinion, but yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, Ms Kirk, please. Um, I'm, I would concur with, uh, with Jim that I think we're actually seeing a lot of the, the, the benefits already. Um, I chair our Integrated Children's Services Partnership, which has uh, representatives from police, health, social services, uh, housing and the, the voluntary sector. And I think uh, over the years, and particularly the last two years, we've seen a significant coming together in uh, specific actions uh, around children. I think before that, it was much more around, we would come together around a project. I think that has actually changed and we're looking at significantly different ways of working together now. We're looking at co-location of health visitors within our early years establishments. We've established um, a multi-agency domestic abuse team, uh, which is showing significant impact on the, the number of children referred to the children's panel. Um, so I think around specific issues like that, there's a lot of very good joined up working. Um, and I think this is really beginning to, to, to bear fruit. Uh, within the, the, the North Ayrshire CPP, we would be looking at um, putting our children's services uh, along with adult services into the health and social care partnership. And it would be, um, uh, in my uh, other, with my other hat on, I'm the director of... Um, of education and skills, but actually it doesn't cause me anxiety that, that, that health are no longer going to be sort of part of the council as such, because I actually think the networks and the working on the ground is solid enough that it actually doesn't matter whose head uh, or what heading you have on the management structures. If you actually get uh, the working together in an integrated way, working effectively, uh, where the, the budget sits and where the, the, the managers and reporting structures are actually mm, matters less. Um, our partnership reports directly into the CPP and they take a very active role, um, as do the Chief Officers Group, in, in monitoring the outcomes for children. Uh, and as Jim was saying earlier, that does prove a challenge because some of the short-term measures uh, are not easy to define. Uh, and we are looking at uh, really long-term societal change out of some of the work that we're doing, particularly with our very youngest children. So I think there is a challenge around that. Um, you know, I'm very happy to see the focus on particularly integrated children's services in the bill. Um, I think we perhaps need to be careful that we're not creating additional planning structures instead of refining some of the planning structures we have, both uh, at a corporate level and at an individual child level. Uh, thank you. It's uh, refreshing to hear that uh, a CPP seems to be working well uh, in this regard. Can, you, can I ask you, um, obviously, uh, GERFEC itself has helped play a part. Can you maybe outline the importance of, of, of what that has uh, achieved? Uh, and beyond that, can I ask if there has been any resistance within um, the uh, CPP thus far towards a move to preventative spend? I think, I think your GIFEC has been um, a bit of a catalyst in changing, uh, changing a lot of the, the thinking. And um, we've uh, essentially established uh, local resourcing groups uh, they've been in place for around four four or five years now, which has meant that um, multi-agency teams can get a very uh, quick response to children who need additional support, but who are not at the level where, you know, you're going to the reporter, you're looking for compulsory measures of care. And that has, um, I think that served as well in keeping 
uh, children out of both compulsory care and leading to situations where they're either out of school or out of the local authority. So, so we've seen a significant, uh, significant change around that. Uh, one of the significant pieces of work around, um, around GERFEC has been carried out across the three Airshares, and that's a project called Airshare, which is uh, an information sharing project. It started in South Ayrshire. It's now rolled out to, to North Ayrshire, and that's involved the essentially the three integrated children's service planning groups coming together in order to take that forward. And we think that that will help um, all of the agencies involved get a much uh, quicker handle on where there are particular issues and being able to share information at that level. So I think, yes, GIRFEC um, has got some significant strengths. I think people are signed up to it. Um, I think there are issues in that some of the planning around GIRFEC, uh, it is a bit of a cluttered landscape because we still have the additional support needs planning. And I think that's an issue sometimes for ourselves uh, and health in, um, you know, well, which plan are you going to have for a child? So that, that's still a bit cluttered. I think that will probably change over time. In terms of preventative spend, I, I haven't detected a reluctance, but what there is is a significant difficulty in disengaging from uh, children who need uh, disengaging costs from children who require perhaps uh, residential uh, support or who require intensive support in order to put that support further down and to invest it in early years. Um, I think our chief, our joint chief officers and the CPP have made a significant investment. I mean, we've put in uh, over a, a million pounds into preventative spend for, for young children. Um, and yes, that's, that has me meant some hard decisions elsewhere. But sometimes it's not an unwillingness. It's just that you, there are groups of young people at the upper end of the spectrum um, who need continuing support, so it's difficult to disengage that, that money in order to divert it. Um, but I think we, we are beginning to see that as the message gets out, that this is actually having, having an impact. It's having an impact on the number of exclusions from school. It's having an impact on the number of young people we place out with the authority, and it's meaning less referrals to the reporter. So I think there's some, some hard evidence there that's actually showing people that this is affecting change. Taylor, please. Um, your question was, when will the benefits materialise? And uh, others have already said that that, that that is, to some extent, true already, that the benefits are materialising. I would say that is even true in relation to um, housing planning and the development of new services, which are essentially preventive and uh, aiming to be low cost. Um, th that can happen where there are good relationships, and my colleagues on the panel have already um, Mention some of these, um, but but for everyone that there that there is good working relationships, there are as many, if not more, where there aren't necessarily good working relationships, and I would cite in particular the experience of uh, reshaping care and the change fund uh, in relation to this, where it's it's very often change fund plans have been developed without reference to housing, without recognition that housing can achieve a huge amount upstream with at, at relatively low costs relative to, to health budgets. Um, and they haven't even been uh, had the opportunity until relatively recently and after a lot of pushing to get to the point where they even sign off the change fund plans. Um, so that's really part of the argument for stronger recognition of the role that housing can bring uh, to all of this and not leaving it to chance and to accident, the accident of good relationships. Mr Fraser, please. And as you would anticipate, I concur with you know, most of what's been said already by, by other witnesses. I think specifically around housing, I would want to emphasise the need for continued partnership, working with housing with the new health and social care partnership across to, to housing. If you look at areas, for instance, in terms of older people, we all know that there's going to be the demographic growth in terms of numbers of older people. They need appropriate housing in terms of to be able to sustain a live you know, in the community. Certainly in our local area, the whole focus in terms of the Council House Build programme has been about what are houses for older people, how can houses be built that actually also sustains adults with complex needs. Because that's the other area of very close partnership working with 
uh, housing. You know, certainly we all absolutely support deinstitutionalisation and people living in the communities, but the days of individual support packages of £200,000 dotted all over a town, rather than some way being able to be delivered effectively in some type of core and cluster model, is really very much linked between care and housing. And I think there's some of the successes in East Ayrshire that we've been able to uh, deliver. I also agree in terms of some of the early wins can be in relation to housing. And that's early wins not only for organisations but for individuals. If we working through care and repair can get simple things like handrails put on, etc., without elaborate assessment processes, people get themselves very quickly and it's very cost effective to do that. And through our local change fund, I think that's been one of our major successes in putting some money across to the types of areas to do it. We've also, through that, been able to put some money to the voluntary sector to assist people in practical supports. So older people do get depression if they sit there looking at a garden that's all overgrown, etc. So we've been able to give some money to some of the voluntary organisations that get young people into work to do SVQs and at the same time get practical supports for um, older people has been some of the big successes uh, that, that we've had. In terms of looking at further uh, early wins, I think for certain co-location of services has been a real positive. We've got a number of good examples of co-location of services where that really supports increased communication. Our mental health services, our learning disability services are all co-located and that gives us you know, immediate wins uh, back. We've been able to develop our intermediate care and enablement services to support early discharge from hospital and prevent admissions. And I think our statistics show how successful that has been and consistently you know, making improvements in terms of delayed discharges and most importantly, helping older people to, uh, to stay at home. In terms of the proposed changes, I think the positives are that it becomes clearer for everyone how to access services. So rather than you know, GPs having a whole range of different people to, to refer to, if we can have clarity about who they can refer to, I think that, that helps us. I think if we can quicker decision making rather than decision making by committee all the time, it becomes clearer uh, as well in what we're doing. I think we have to look at the areas in terms of locality working. In terms of locality working, there can't be separate issues of locality working for the different bills that are around just now. We have single communities we have to consult with communities together and it has to come out of communities about what their priorities are and how they want and think it's right to implement some of the national priorities. So that real engagement with local communities, I think, is essential. And that part of that that actually engages our local GPs again in that is, again, absolutely essential. We have developed CHPs that I think we have lost you know, from um, LHCCs, the engagement of GPs, and we really need the GPs back in that in a meaningful way that they can see changes, that they can influence uh, what's going on in uh, communities. I do think there are lots of opportunities as we go forward in the bills, but it has to be done together at communities. It makes sense at the front line at communities. Okay, Anne McTaggart, please. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, could I ask our, our health colleagues, um, the practical issues for the local authorities and the health boards in trying to implement the two bills together, do you foresee any practical issues in that? Um, Start first. Sure. Yes, we do. Um, there's a number of um, issues that we have. Um, both aligning both processes is problematic. Having um, what could be perhaps be regarded as duplicate um, strategic planning systems is going to cause us issues. Um, but they're not issues that we are going to run away from. They're issues we're going to grab and make mm -hmm. the best of. Um, we have problems with making sure that the two processes communicate well with each other. So when we're planning for the implementation of the new children and young people's bill, we're actually having to make sure that we're very sort of conscious of any actions that have been taken on the other side. Um, and I think the recognition of the need to work better together is... Um, didn't come as early in the process as we would have wished it to have. I think it's there now, um, and we're starting to build from that basis, but I think the two separate processes coming from slightly different perspectives um, has been problematic, and it would have been much more helpful if they'd been brought together at a much earlier part in the process. 
I think there could have been an awful lot more learning um, from the experience of children and young people services under GERFIC and the processes we've had to go through. Carol mentioned some of the gains and I think where we are is under GERFIC we have to look at culture, systems and practice and what we have done well has changed our culture and we've moved away from our sort of silo working practices mm -hmm. into um, large meetings something on occasion where we work through all of the issues we have and recognise we've got more than one audience for anything we're trying to deal with and, and go forward from there. Um, but we are in a position now to see what those potential hurdles are going to be and we're working towards dealing with those. Dr Mullen? Um, I think you could have a very long discussion about where it could go very badly wrong again in Glasgow as it did the last time and I think it's really important that this time we do get it right. Um, I think one of the biggest lessons is to engage just purely from a GP perspective, directly with general practice. And there are different models around the chips in Glasgow at the moment, but in Glasgow South, where I'm from, <clears throat> we have a large established GP committee, which engages with senior management uh, to discuss policy and local initiatives. And that's a way, and, and we have minuted meetings and we report back to local colleagues, et cetera, and we've done some learning events, et cetera, et cetera. So it's progressing. Um, that should really be built on, um, we feel, because it's a good way of trying to um, implement stuff that's coming to us that sometimes seems very hierarchical and full of bureaucratic speech when actually we just want to know if we go out and see someone uh, and identify an unmet need as a GP we actually get a service to put them into and at the moment there's a mismatch we're obviously doing anticipatory care planning so we're going out and visiting lots of housebound elderly people who were traditionally chopped out of the quaff and now we're identifying a lot of unmet need but we don't have the resources to match the need. So it's that discussion that has to be linked very much into these experienced professional views who are able to inform the process about what needs to be happening in parallel as the work progresses. I mean, realise it's not quick work, it's slow work, um, but, it, but it has to be the two-way two -way thing. Ms Kirk, do you want to <coughs> make some comment there? Um, I think... Uh, I think there have been particular issues for, for health and that they have some very complex arrangements. Um, and uh, I, I know that, that colleagues in health who've been represented uh, on our group often have um, some very uh, complex reporting arrangements uh, in order to go through. And I think uh, in some ways, that both the, the chief officers and the CPP have managed to cut through some of that. But um, it does require a considerable uh, amount, of, uh, amount of work. So I think that um, there is the potential here to actually simplify uh, a lot of what we're doing. But I do think um, there needs to be learning from uh, both the work and integrated children's services for the, the way we take forward um, integration of health and social care, but also learning from the work that's been done in, in adult services and how you actually uh, create the momentum to make some of the changes. So I think there's a bit of joined up learning there that's still to happen. Taylor, do you want to comment? Uh, we didn't comment on the uh, children's bill at all. I, all I would say is that uh, at the consultation stage, children's services and housing services were lumped together and the focus on children's services in this committee tends to exclude a focus on housing services and all I would plea is that you, in the absence of a bill, that you still pay attention to the housing dimension of the argument. I think you've got that message across, okay, Ms good. Taylor. Thank you. Uh, Mr Fraser, please. I, I think I would just add that we need to be careful we don't lose anything in the changes. So just now community health partnerships have a responsibility across, you know, cradle to grave for children, adults and older people. If we move to health and social care partnership committees that only have a responsibility for adults and older people, we need to be careful we don't then leave children's services sitting without an easy strategic voice into councils, community planning partners and the health board. So in terms of as we take this forward together and plan across the bills, we need to make sure it's for betterment and there's not actually a loss in strategic planning. You want to come back, Anne? No, no, it's fine, thank you. Take Margaret Mitchell, please. Good morning. Um, Dr Mullen, you mentioned that you're doing some very good things, but uh, sometimes you run out of resources. Uh, one way possibly to address this, and it's to all the panel really, is to make sure these positive outcomes are assessed and, and logged on. So particularly mm. for local authorities, is this going to be integrated into benchmarking? And um, how do you 
uh, assess the outcomes, the positive and the negative, because the negative you can learn things from too and do things differently. So could I maybe go round the panel and ask you about that? Because we have heard some very positive things this morning um, about how you are sharing services and integrating, and that is welcome news. But equally, we've heard good things from CPPs in the past that haven't materialised when, um, when we go to the local communities. So, just a little bit more detail of how you're pinning this down would be helpful. We go from right to left this time. Mr Fraser, do you want to start, please? I mean, in terms of, of how we look at that, I think you can evidence it just through numbers. So sometimes that is about, you know, like how many, you know, admissions are there to hospital of people over 75. You can do it through things like the number and proportion of your, your elderly population that are, are staying at home. It's much harder and you know, less tangible to look at well-being in communities, to look at some of the longitudinal things that you know we talk about. If we can do preventative spend, we need to do preventative spend so people don't need some of the health and social care services in 20 years' time. And I mean that everything, everything from the 50-year-old male with alcohol problems right through to unborn children, and we need to look at how we, we do that. So some of that is very difficult to do, and it will be very longitudinal in how we do it. We can use indicators, you know, just now. Some of that is about how much we're man managing to put anticipatory care plans in together. And I absolutely accept, accept, unless you can actually follow up then, then you've only spent a process without improving someone's life. But we can put them in place and we can start to show that. I feel just now what we have are indicators of how it is, and it's much harder to actually get the positive, you know, tangible things that we'll see as things go forward. Ms Taylor. I, I would comment by saying that, first of all, some of our colleagues in the Housing Coordinating Group are actively working with the Outcomes Group on the definition of the outcomes and the targets and indicators that go with all of that. Our general view is that uh, well-being is not sufficiently addressed in all of that and there's still too much of a focus on the costs and uh, impacts of existing services than the services that there might be uh, in future, but that, that's, that's not something I want to rehearse in greater detail here. Um, the second point I would make is that some of our members of the SFHA have undertaken SROI, Social Return on Investment uh, Studies, um, into the impact of the benefit of services and uh, showing the value. I can think of one by Link Housing Association, which did a project I can send you details of, which showed that for every pound they invested in an advice and information service, they were getting 27 pounds of value back. Um, there's another one by Hanover Beald and uh, Trust Housing Associations, which looks at the value of adaptations for older people. So I, I can send you details of both of those kinds of things. I've seen those before, but uh, we'd be happy to see them again. Uh, Ms Kirk, please. Um, I, I think there is um, a real issue with, uh, with benchmarking um, because benchmarking tends to be against individual services and individual um, parts of the service. And it's easy, to, it's easy for me, for instance, in education to benchmark. We, we benchmark to the hilt across other services. You know, schools benchmark against other schools and it's, it's very embedded. And we, we're also good at benchmarking against children at the at acute end, if you like. We're good at benchmarking on around looked after children. We're good at benchmarking against children who come into the, the, the child protection world. But I think we're right. The benchmarking around children um, where there's issues of well-being or neglect, that's quite a difficult issue to get into. And we tend to rely very much on input measures on what you're doing to address it rather than the it's very it, there's really a sort of conceptual difficulty in actually getting benchmarking for the impact you're making there uh, we've done quite a lot of work in trying to identify indicators and we think we're, we're getting there with them by looking at the stretch aims of the, the the early years collaborative and working back to well how do we how do we actually how do we actually get there and what are the measures that tell us that we're getting there uh, and one of the things that we've taken forward uh, jointly with East and South Ayrshire and with NHS Ayrshire and Arden has been an investment on the Solihull parenting approach. What we can measure is 
how many people are doing it, what impact they feel it's having on the, the clients that they deal with or the families they deal with. But in terms of hard measures of what is it saving us and what is the actual difference to the well-being of children, that's actually very difficult to capture. So I think there's a lot of work going on around that, but I think it's, I think it's still in its infancy around that particular area. Certainly, think that you gave some good examples earlier in number of exclusions yes. going down. That's mm -hmm. a tangible thing, but that's not always possible. So I, I yeah. take your point, Dr. Mullen. Um, I mean, I think you can look at the certainly the epidemiology of stats that's already um, collected at the moment around unscheduled admissions to hospital, number of days spent in hospital for elderly people before they get moved into perhaps a nursing bed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I would agree some of the more qualitative outcomes, which are are take longer to develop because you need to quite often uh, involve the patient or the client mm -hmm. in that uh, research agenda, it requires a commitment to do that work. Um, there are a lot of short-term measure outcomes, there aren't a lot of long-term measure outcomes. We base a lot of our um, evidence in early interventions in the old study, which is still ongoing. Um, we have nothing similar to that here. We were prepared to look 20 years down the line and what happened early on and how we prevented something happening. You mentioned the social return and investment action for children. had a very interesting report in Northampton about a family intervention project and the money saved if they intervened early on. So there are ways of doing it. It's pulling these strands of research together into an integrated proposal. The deep end is, is working on that. We're very keen to do that, um, but it would need to be uh, resourced so we would have the staff and the ability to do that because at the moment there is very little evidence to show for all the work that's going on. Sir Carroll. It's an excellent question and quite difficult to answer for a number of reasons. I would agree with um, all of my colleagues and, and what they have said. I think that GERFIC gives us the model for change and gives us a common language so we can communicate with each other. I think there's a number of areas that we require um, to develop um, in a much more integrated way. I think we need to develop better systems for looking at contribution um, and develop a contribution analysis that looks at all of the different um, systems that contribute to the well-being of a child and how we actually measure the or quantify the benefits that those systems can be brought um, together um, and the impact they have on the child. I think we need to move away from um, looking at children in the sense of what do you do with a five-year-old and pick up on what you do in terms of a life course approach. So what do you do when you're working with uh, young people to prepare them for parenthood? What do you do with new parents and how do you develop that? How do the issues identified within early years be carried forward into primary school and, and into secondary school? How do you measure that across the life course so you've got some kind of longitudinal analysis of the benefits of the different contributions that are made across the different systems? Um, and I think one of the key and one of the benefits to um, joint working is that we all come at this with a number of different skills. I would argue that a public health approach to these issues would be extremely um, beneficial and helpful. I think that public health as a science has the skills um, to actually enable us to develop a proper contribution analysis and how we measure these things. Um, and it's about making sure that once we have established and agreed the way forward, that we stick to that over a long enough period of time to see the benefits coming from the process we were engaged in just now. The early years framework, for example, um, is really helpful and really positive. It gives a good focus on prevention and early identification of issues. It gives us the opportunity to engage with parents in a very positive way. Um, and I think one of the key things that's missing so far from our um, discussion is really the contribution the communities can make to that process and how we engage with communities and how many of the answers to the questions professionals are asking just now are with the communities and they can really inform professional practice. But I think that um, combination um, of approaches from the different disciplines and different um, sciences that are involved will help take that forward, but we don't have systems yet developed that can measure co the total contribution to an individual child over, the, over a life course, and I think that's very much what we want to have a look at and start to develop. And finally, convener, if I could just ask about the provision where every child should have a named person in the Young People and, and Children's Bill, just about the implications of that. Do you have any concerns about it? Do you think it's necessary? Um, with the chaotic lifestyles that sadly some children have, we can be looking at um, many different public bodies having to share information. So if you could just generally comment on your views on that, that would be very helpful. Mr Carroll. 
Um, in Ayrshire and our systems are well advanced. We know um, that our health visiting team are going to pick up the role of named person uh, pre-5. We know our midwifery service is going to sort of be working very hard to take that forward. If we're going to truly implement um, not just the, the word of the bill, but we're going to truly try to achieve what the bill is, is looking for in terms of a much better society being created in Scotland, that we're going to improve our culture and take that forward, then we have to consider the amount of time it's going to take to engage with those more difficult families. Um, and that, we believe, is a significant burden that's going to be um, created over a period of time, admittedly, with both our midwifery and our health visiting services. We have time at this point um, to meet our statutory obligations, which we are doing, we're doing quite well. But if we are to have a conversation with a new mum around about alcohol and how that relates to fetal alcohol syndrome and the impact that could have on her, her children, her family over the later life course, then that takes um, the development of a relationship. The current systems don't allow for that on every occasion. That takes the development of um, good communication skills and being able to raise different difficult issues and difficult agendas. That's going to be problematic. If we're asking a health visitor as a named person to coordinate all of the information that's coming from a number of different services, to pull all that together, to adopt some kind of basic analysis of that, to identify whether there's issues there for that particular family, then to pass those issues on, that takes significant time. And we are not confident at this point in time that the resources are there within those services to enable us to do that. We will be able to perform our services according to the word of the legislation. That's not our issue. If you really want us to get in behind the issues that are there and find resolutions for those issues, that takes time and resources. And at this point in time, that's not there. We expect to see investment being recycled, if you like, from the money that's been put into early years uh, collaboratives at this point in time. Later in the life course, we, say, we hope to see a reduction in children who are looked after and accommodated, for example. We don't have the systems that can identify where those savings have been made, because that happens some 10 to 15 years later, perhaps, and then how to recycle that funding back into early years to continue this process and to build on that process. I think there's a number of challenges in, in, in what you've been asking. Dr Mullen. Um, I agree with a lot of what um, Mr Carl is saying. Um, I would say that um, under fives it is logical to have health visitors in person uh, for preschoolers. Um, I think for school children there is a massive gap there. When you become vulnerable at five or four, you're st probably still vulnerable at six, seven and eight. There is not enough capacity for that work to be ongoing in a meaningful way in the education system, I don't believe. Um, I mean, I'm quite relaxed about the name person idea because GPs, everyone, most people have a named GP and GPs are often the source of referral for many, many different agencies um, looking for bits of information or have something to tell us about a family or an individual. Um, and I would like to see GPs far more, and the deep end have really stated this very strongly, far more involved in uh, the involvement of vulnerable children and families. There needs to be something more substantive in general practice. Ms Kirk. Um, I think this is a challenge for a lot of services. Um, I mean, some of the discussion we've had is whether, um, given that around probably over 98% of uh, three to five-year-olds uh, are in early years provision, where they're seen every day by, by nursery practitioners, whether the named person wouldn't have been better situated in, in, in that place. And I think we, we've raised that on, on a number of occasions. Uh, we have been operating this through GIRFEC and through the GIRFEC guidance for, for, for some time, but it, it isn't easy. And I think it is that bit around, um, usually in, in primary schools, um, head teachers or the additional support needs coordinator within a, a primary school who's often either a deputy or a principal teacher, gathering um, that amount of information from a range of agencies. And that can be quite complex. It can be quite time consuming, you know, before you, you actually ha have a look at it. It's not that there's a lack of willingness, but it, the, the capacity to do it, it is a, it is a strain, it is a strain on the, on the system. Um, I think uh, that perhaps isn't as much of an issue as when 
you're then looking at a young person with more complex needs, and it's a transfer from that to being a lead professional. Um, and I think the the that does tend to sit with social services, and that's not actually necessarily where it should sit. In some cases, it is better with the school or with a health professional. And I think there's the, that needs a, a bit more work in order to actually free up the time for these appropriate professionals to, to, to take that role. Uh, in our consultation with uh, parents around this, we had quite a, a bit of a kickback about the term named person. And a number of our, our parent councils expressed significant concern about this, you know, I should be my 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 child's named person. When we explained the concept behind it, they were fine with it, but their initial reaction to the name was not uh, uh, w w was not one of uh, unqualified uh, approval. Um, so I think that I think that that is a challenge. I think we need to be very explicit as to to what this role is and how it will how it will be how it will be implemented. I do think that some of the things around information sharing and shared systems to gather that will make this less onerous, but uh, there's still an issue about how that, that how that comes together. And I think there's one other issue that we have concerns about, and that is who is the named person for children who are home educated, because uh, education has no uh, no locus in that, and if it's to continue with health who would take that forward for young people of primary and secondary school age. And that's not explicit in, in, in the legislation. And I think it is, is an area of concern that if we are looking for a net that's supporting every child, there are a group of children who could slip through that. Thank you, Ms Taylor, not really your Nothing field. Add, no. uh, Mr Fraser, please. I, I would concur with what uh, Carol's saying and that difference between <coughs> some of the most vulnerable children who have a lead professional and, you know, would have social work involvement and multi-agency involvement and then the wider population of, of children mm -hmm. where the concept is about giving them easy named access to, uh, to that world and a proportionate, you know, like access to, uh, to professionals rather than people being involved every day in their life or taking over any of the role of parents. Mm -hmm. okay. Just before, Ms Taylor, do you have no locus in this, given there's information that can be very pertinent about housing and what's maybe going on within a home that I would imagine the Housing Association could be... Yes, a social, a social landlord may well have an understanding of what's going on in the home, and that was occurring to me as, as I was hearing this, but we have opted not to make any formal comment on the bill, and I don't just want to kind of react to things. Mm. I, I think the important point here is that... Uh, landlord's relationship is primarily with the householder who will always be an adult, mm -hmm. even if they're, you know, at 16 or 17 or 18. I think it would be fair to say that uh, housing assistants throughout the country play a major role <laughs> in finding difficulties Absolutely. and pointing them out. Yeah. But I think they're unlikely to be the named person mm -hmm. in this regard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key thing. And that's yeah. why I said, okay. not really your field. Absolutely. Um, and I, I'm sure that housing assistants and housing visitors across this nation will continue to do what they've done uh, in this regard for many, many years. And, and it's not because we're not aware of chaotic lifestyles or anything. I mean, I could elaborate further on that, but That's this is not the place. OK, thank you for that. Yeah. Richard Baker, please. Thank you, Kavina. My question is to Carol Kirk, reflecting on two things, interesting you said. You said there's potential to simplify structures to, uh, for, for, to benefit services, which is obviously something we'd all support. But you also said we need to be careful we don't just create additional new structures rather than simplifying uh, structures, making a process easier. Is that a balance where the Scottish Government's going to get right, do you think? I mean, obviously, we're also considering the, the, um, the, uh, the public um, uh, bodies joint working bill. Is that balance right as, as a proposal stand, or does that need to be worked on further, do you think? I, th I think it possibly needs to be worked on further. Um, I, I think the... Uh, I mean, even in the... the, the the Children and Young People Bill. Um, yes, there's much more of a, a sort of statutory imperative around um, the children's service planning, which I think people would welcome. But I would question why we need a plan on corporate parenting that sits out with that. I can't see why that wouldn't be merged into to the same plan. If that plan's looking at a whole range of vulnerable children, why wouldn't that be encompassed in the same 
in the same plan. And it is, it's issues like that. I think around the uh, individual uh, individual children, um, I think it's a, it's, it's a complex framework, not only for local government, but for parents. Um, GIRFEC, I think, <coughs> provides a very structured and very helpful way of planning for a child in the round, uh, and I'm very supportive of that. Um, however, it does cross over with a coordinated support plan, for instance, for a child that has complex needs. Um, and the additional support needs uh, legislation doesn't sit entirely comfortably with the, the guidance around, around GIRFEC. And it is possible to merge them, but actually you're still within two statutory frameworks, which doesn't make sense to professionals working in that, and I think probably makes less sense to parents. Can I go back to a, a point earlier about GERFEC? Uh, and I mentioned that I'd been visiting some doctor surgeries during the course of the recess. Um, uh, what I'm interested in is systems that don't talk to one another which compl uh, complicate uh, the spread of information. Um, can I maybe get your experiences round about that? Um, could a bit of common sense, a bit of gumption be applied into uh, dealing with some of these things? Do we overly complicate these kind of systems? Maybe Mr Carroll first, please. I th yes, I think there's a real issue there. Um, the professionals um, are good at communicating with each other. Um, but if we want to deal with the issues that are on the table, then we really need to have a better look at both from a Scottish Government perspective, um, and I'll pronounce this really carefully, but the Scottish Government needs to girfeck itself. Um, and they really need to look at the interrelationship between different bits of uh, legislation um, and how they cut across each other and the number of demands that have been put on different aspects of pro professional organisations. We don't need conflicting legislation. We don't need legislation that tells us to report to 16 different organisations all on the same subject. Um, and a number of issues... Um, that we are dealing with um, in the local authority areas, the health board areas, come from that source. I think in terms of the systems that we have, we have a significant amount of work to be done to resolve those systems, to make sure that we're actually working to a common system and a common language. In Ayrshire Naren, we have Ayrshire, and we hope that will take us um, some way down that road. Um, but there is still a need for the organisations that we work with, education and social work health, to have their own systems underneath all of that. And that is an industry in itself, and they all have different reporting uh, mechanisms that work within that. And somebody that sits in my position frequently um, answers the same question to a number of different aspects of Scottish Government. Um, and again, that's about uh, public money, public time, all being used um, could, that it could be used better and more effectively when we have the issues to deal with that have been so well outlined by um, the, the other members of this panel. The phrase Gerfec, Gerfec itself has to be said very carefully. Um, I nearly didn't say it the right way there. Uh, Dr Mullen, please. Um, I think sensitive data sharing is a real issue for general practice and other agencies and... and how you uh, filter what you talk about informally in corridor chat and various other ways and then what you're prepared to put down on paper. With uh, child protection issues, I think it's, it's fairly straightforward. I don't think many GPs wring their hands over that. If it's a suspected NEI, or et cetera, you would divulge that information quite readily. But we're talking about the majority of uh, vulnerable children in this country, probably about 20% of, of one million children who have unmet needs. Now, the sharing of information around the subtleties of parenting and all the issues around deprivation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that's a big piece of work that still needs to go on um, because some parents are very reluctant for you to, naturally enough, speak to other agencies about their own personal private lives because that does impact on their parenting skills. And I think the only way around that is to to have extensive work done between the frontline GPs, social work, who are probably the main referral agency. If you're talking about catapulting them into the child protection system or, or for legislative intervention. Um, but otherwise, in that, the majority of children who are vulnerable in general practice will just be signposted into other services for support. They're not being signposted in 
to prosecute the parents because they're battering their children. It's parents who are not coping for whatever reason. Now, a lot of that information comes into the consultation. It's how you filter that out. It's experience, having experienced GPs that have met a lot of children and families in their lifetime. But it's also having the work supported within the GP contract. Thank you. Could I ask everyone to be brief now, because I'm hoping to get another question. And uh, Ms. Kirk, please. Um, I, I think uh, I think that's right. I think the particular issue is not the the children at the, the child protection end. It's that very large group of, of children where where poverty and uh, difficult home circumstances are, are impacting. I think we need to get much better at that di direct communication around there that possibly doesn't involve uh, social services. I think one of the things that we've looked at with Ayrshire, in fact, we were in a meeting about it yesterday, is how we allow GP, how GPs can have automatic access to that. So there might be a wee concern that they have that they don't feel um, of its own right it can be shared, but if they have access to what other professionals have put on that, it maybe builds a picture and they can say, right, I, I do have a real concern here. And it's getting that level of shared information as easily uh, as we can, um, I think, is a real issue for us. Mr Fraser. I think one of my uh, responsibilities is I run out of our social work services across Ayrshire. And through that experience, being able to work through social work systems and try and get out of our health you know, information is a very difficult uh, challenge. So the areas around information sharing, whether that be electronic information sharing or better still just talking to each other, I think would be you know, a real move forward. And that's where co-location starts to really come in. And some of these services I spoke about that we've co-located in mental health and learning disability services, it really does happen that the social worker just goes along to the learning disability nurse and says, you're going to come out with me today and go and see this. That happens and that works in terms of, of communication. But on another level, we really do need to look at how we develop you know, electronic information systems. And I know through the public bodies mill, some money's been made available for us to help move that on again. But it's something that's been a challenge for us for at least the last decade. Tom Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Is just to follow up uh, is the point that Mr. Fraser made earlier, and I think it's been partly answered uh, in the last round of uh, answers, and that was the issue about the involvement of GPs, because Mr. Fraser made a reference to the fact that GPs weren't as actively involved in the community health partnerships as they could be, and my concern is particularly around the name person and protecting vulnerable young people is how do we ensure the smooth transition from the preschool to the school period uh, and the appropriate professional being the named person? Because it is a, a situation where we could end up, the, in terms of preschool, it's a health visitor, when it could, they start school, it could be a social worker, it could be a teacher, it could be someone else. Are there issues that may arise that makes and what we must do and how do we do this is ensure that every child is actually has a named person and that named person is not only able to gather information but is able to uh, give information to other professionals to ensure that these children are protected. Mr. Fraser. But for me, you know, one of the, the issues about looking for success and this is very basic level of a named person, as if the child and the family know who that named person is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in, in my service, you know, someone will say, do you have a social worker? And they'll say yes, and then they'll give us a name of somebody that left two years ago. You know, like sometimes they'll say no, and yet we know they do have a social worker. You know, so there are real issues about if the named person is going to fulfil its function, and you're, you're right to say children do move through systems, then it has to be clearly communicated to that child and that family who that named person is so that that, that, that can be successful. Families continue to tell us about, you know, not having continuity of people who support them is a real issue. And I do think, and I know that's where GP colleagues will come in and say a lot of the time the continuity actually does come through the practice. Kirk. Um, I think... Um, the key to that is, is good relationships between the early years establishments and the, the health visitors. 
because the health visitors will have a, a huge caseload of, of children for whom they, they are the named person. And then when they, they, they transit from the early years establishment to, to school, that will become someone uh, someone in the school. Although on some occasions where it's a very vulnerable child, the health visitor may retain that uh, until an appropriate time for handover. But the key one there is to make sure that the there are transition meetings and transition plans around any of the children that the health visitor has a concern with and linking the health visitors very directly to the early years establishments and involving them in the transition into into primary one is really the key way of making sure that that, that happens and also making sure that parents know when the child moves into primary one who the named person for them becomes and that's a key issue taylor I want to come back on the previous question. I'm happy to leave it till the end if you want me to do that. Thank you, Dr. Muller. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to go into too much about the named person and over fives. I mean, I think that that's something that still has to be worked out. Um, I think we, we are still often the referral point for older children because agencies have withdrawn for whatever reason. They don't need help anymore, or it's been another occasion where they become vulnerable again. And because most people have an named GP services or somebody will come to the GP, I think there is a big schism though between education and general practice. There's not enough dialogue there. Um, and I think, you know, the deep end has talked about this integrated working, the attached worker. I think the only way to make any of these systems work is to have the integration of communication as much about the professionals being able to communicate with each other, understand each other. And certainly general practice in terms of child health has been very peripheral to many of these developments, when in fact, we're quite often the central point of referral for many agencies. So uh, I think the DPN's got a very clear view on that and it's outlined in our proposals. Mr Carroll. I would 100% agree with what um, Carol said in the sense of we need to very carefully align health visitors with um, LEA's establishments. There needs to be a really good relationship built upon and maintained within that process. Um, my concern for health visitors is really about the resource requirements and additional burden that's going to um, bring there. GPs for us are the critical partners in most of what we do in children and young people's services. They are the sort of um, pivotal point within which sort of families revolve. So we have to get communication systems developed well for them um, and support their practice and their amongst the sort of, if you, if you have hierarchy um, within the system, they're amongst the most valuable partners. The difficulty we have is really seeing beyond the sort of health visitor, beyond the age of five, and the burden that's then placed on our education colleagues in terms of the named person, and how um, they have to have good systems in place to support that. And we're very um, new to the whole process. We don't have a huge amount of experience yet in those transitions um, arrangements, but I think good communication, um, professionals talking to professionals, making sure we're talking the same language, making sure we understand the issues that are being raised is critical to the whole process. What I do think um, the strength is behind all of that is we have well-established communication frameworks that we can raise these issues within and we will find um, shared uh, resolutions to that. But the problem shouldn't be underestimated, both in terms of the additional resource that's required and the critical nature of that relationship between health visitors and LEA's establishments. Ms Taylor, I'll let you come back very briefly. Very on briefly. Pages. I think I, I would say that in relation to the general issue about systems not talking to each other, there's an operational dimension which we've spent a lot of time talking about and a strategic dimension. The operational dimension does actually intersect with the housing system in the sense that, for example, someone who, who is leaving care or who may have had a, a history of social work intervention as a child may then be at risk of homelessness and may enter the... The, the system, if you like, the housing system as a social tenant through uh, the homeless route. And there is an interesting issue there about how much information then passes with that person to the, the people who take them on as a landlord uh, to enable them to understand uh, what interventions have worked, who's been involved in the past and all of that kind of thing. And operational practice is much patchier than it, it really should be. Um, the other side of, of the operational information is that I know that there are projects in Glasgow where housing associations are actively working with police and fire services um, to try and make sure that they get effective data sharing and information sharing and knowledge sharing at the local scale to be able to tackle um, problems on a preventive basis. And they've been able to, they've been able to document the extent to which they have saved lives 
and extensive budgets on vandalism and uh, fire damage and all sorts of things. But I come back to the point that I made at the beginning in relation to strategic information, that there's a whole lot of uh, information around strategic planning that relies on decent data sharing and integ uh, integration of practice around strategy, and that's where housing can make a, a significant contribution. But only if it's required, I think. No further questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I thank you very much for your evidence today? Um, I think it's been very useful. Uh, and I'll suspend uh, the meeting uh, for a change of witnesses till round about 11.30.
Thank you. Uh, good morning again. Um, we now move on to our final panel. I'd like to welcome Alec Neil, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, Aileen Campbell, MSP, Minister for Children and Young People, Kathleen Bessos, Deputy Director of Integration and Reshaping Care, John Patterson, Divisional Solicitor uh, with Food, Health and Community Care, Alison Taylor, Team Leader, Integration and Reshaping Care, Philip Raines, Head of Child Protection and Children's Le Legislation, and Madeleine Boyd, Solicitor, Communities and Education, all from the Scottish Government, of course. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make some opening remarks, please? Yes, yes, please, Convener. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting Aileen and I to, to give you this presentation and to answer questions this morning. Uh, what I'll confine my remarks to is the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Bill, which is a bill, of course, dealing with the integration of adult health and social care. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to provide a framework for the integration of health and social care with the aim of improving outcomes for service users, carers and their families, and that's at the heart of our policy. We will legislate for national health and wellbeing outcomes that will underpin the requirement for health boards and local authorities to plan effectively together to deliver quality, sustainable care services for their constituent population. Importantly, the bill aims to bring together the substantial resources of health and social care to deliver joined up effective and efficient services that meet the increasing number of people with longer term and often complex needs, many of whom are older. The bill requires health boards and local authorities to establish integrated arrangements through partnership working, statutory partners to integrate via one of two models, delegation to a body corporate established as a joint board, or delegation to each other as a lead agency, the latter itself having three possible models. The health boards and local authorities will be required to delegate functions and budgets to the integrated partnership, and secondary legislation will set out these uh, and will cover adult primary care and community care, adult social care and aspects of acute hospital services. Integrated partnerships will be able to include other services, such as children's services, where there is a local arrangement to do so. Indeed, there are areas across Scotland, such as West Lothian and Highland, where this is already working well. Each partnership will be required to establish locality planning arrangements, which will provide a forum for local professional leadership of service planning. And the integrated partnership will be required to prepare and implement a strategic commissioning plan, which will use the totality of resources available across health and social care to plan for the needs of local populations. Importantly, professionals, uh, professional service users, GPs, the third and independent sectors will be embedded in this process as key decision makers. This is in the context of public service reform and alongside the Children and Young People Bill being led by Aileen as part of the government's broader agenda to deliver public services that better meet the needs of the people and our communities. The bill provides a legislative framework for partnership working at a strategic and local level involving professional service users and partners. The planning and delivery principles in the bill encapsulate the principles of the Christie Commission, putting the person at the centre of service planning and delivery and requires a focus on prevention and anticipatory care planning. Uh, as to why we need to legislate, my predecessor, the Deputy First Minister, put forward the proposal to Parliament in December 2011 to bring forward this legislation, which had a cross-party consensus. I think we're all aware of attempts in the past to integrate these services to a greater or lesser success, and it is felt that underpinning this process with the legislative requirement is absolutely essential to achieving our objective. We're not starting with a blank sheet. Many areas across Scotland are already working in partnership to deliver integrated services. Furthermore, we've considered the evidence from across the UK and we're mindful about applying this in a Scottish context. But I'm clear that in order to achieve a consistency of progress, it is necessary to set out in legislation a framework, not too prescriptive, a framework which will deliver the necessary changes to meet the future demand on services. 
and I welcome the opportunity uh, to provide further clarity on the bill to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Sec Secretary. Minister, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, committee, uh, convener and good morning, committee, and uh, thank you as well for inviting me to give evidence on Children's Service and Services Planning Part 3 of the Children and Young People Scotland Bill, which was introduced to Parliament on the 17th of April. Now, the Children and Young People Bill is fundamental to securing the Scottish Government's aim of making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. And through the bill, the Scottish Government aims to ensure that children's rights properly influence the design and delivery of policies and services. The bill aims to improve the way services support children and families. It also aims to strengthen the role of earlier support in children's and families' lives. And it also aims to ensure better permanence planning for children and their families. Now, the Christie Commission report on the future delivery of Scotland's public services highlighted how services must better meet the needs of the people and the communities that they serve. And welcoming the report, we set out a vision of reform through early intervention and preventative spending, greater integration and partnership at a local level, workforce development and a sharper, more transparent focus on performance. The Children and Young People Bill is fundamental in, towards achieving that ambition in rights and services. It aims to put Scotland at the forefront of services which give children, young people and their families what they need and what they deserve, one that finds better ways to offer better life chances to each and every child in Scotland. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to the committee about part three of the Bill on Children's Services Planning. In recent years, there has been an increasing integration in the way public bodies develop, plan and operate services in support of children and young people. However, unless those services work together, there is a danger that something important might be missed and a child or young person's well-being suffers. Children and young people need services that are not simply coordinated, but share a holistic approach towards well-being and early intervention. Children deserve services that routinely and consistently consider this full spectrum of their needs. And part three of the bill sets out the duties that require local authorities and health boards and the assistance of other public board bodies and third sector organisations to work together to plan and develop joint children's services plans every three years. The intention is that those bodies responsible for expenditure, planning and delivery of services will work together to improve the well-being of all children and young people in their area. Currently, there are no requirements for public bodies to report collectively on how the lives of children and young people are improving. And in order to give the public and children and young people a full picture of how well-being is being promoted, supported and safeguarded, local authorities and health boards will report each year on the extent to which they have achieved the aims of the Children's Services Plan. This will enhance the implementation of Getting It Right for Every Child and make a direct accountable link for the public between local services and outcomes for children and young people. So I hope, uh, convener, that, that gives some useful background and like the Cabinet Secretary, I'm happy to take any questions from the committee on part three of the bill which you're looking at today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I, I think today we have mainly heard positive evidence round about the difference that GERFEC has made. Um, but a few things cropped up. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, the perennial question uh, round about communication and systems that don't talk to one another. Um, how are we going to, to tackle that, Minister? Because that does cause a, a, a great deal of, of difficulty sometimes. Uh, and the other question was round about a uh, named uh, person uh, and a very interesting point was raised about how do we deal with named persons uh, for those children that are home educated uh, because normally at that stage in their lives uh, it would be an educationalist that would be the named person. I wonder if you could mm -hmm. clarify these points, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener, and, and it's good to hear that there was such a positive session you had about GERFEC. Um, GERFEC, as you know, has been around for a while and this bill is an opportunity to uh, embed that further, um, putting the child at the heart of design and delivery of services. Now, the bill in part three of the bill that we're looking at uh, in terms of the question you raise about communication is about making sure that joint working happens. Now, we've heard, I think you heard this morning, a, a number of good examples of where that joint working is in place and where communication, strong relationships um, are so crucial in terms of delivering the services that child or family needs. So this bill, uh, the joint services um, 
element of it, the fact that we're wanting to have um, a reporting mechanism that brings together not just the local authorities but the health boards as well, will make sure that that is standardised and embedded within, within the bill to make sure that there is a holistic approach re reflecting the holistic needs of a child, ensuring that their well-being is met. Now, through the, the course of...